Yeah. Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain, you're listening to episode 30 of the Spartacast League. I'm Phelan, and joining us tonight is Moon Paul. Yours truly. Hey there. This is the second time you've been on the show, right? Yeah, absolutely. Nice. And it's the pleasure's all mine, of course. Awesome. Get to look at more shit. Thank you. Talk about more arseholes. Oh, usual thing. So it's been about a month since we were last on air, and at that time, a lot's happened. We plan to cover the best and the worst of it today, beginning with Venezuela, where the people have spoken and have rejected the coup against Maduro and the Bolivarian Socialist Movement. In what was supposed to be the last phase of the coup, military officers set fire to orders given to them by Guaido and stood by the Chavistas while Guaido attempted to hold a rally in a working-class neighborhood only to have his agitators chased out of the neighborhood and their asses kicked by the local population. (laughs) Even with multiple assaults on the Chavista movement, the people have remained resilient in combating every attack the United States and its operatives have set against it. Moonpaul, what's your take on this? Well, first off... I don't think Guaido was being very strategic about the whole thing. I mean, to be fair, if he's going to go into a working class neighborhood, knowing, I'd imagine, that the majority of Chavistas are from working class backgrounds, of course he's going to get his fucking arse kicked if he goes in and spreads his bollocks. I mean, because as we've seen before and as we talked about a few episodes ago, uh, the majority of the Chavista movement is from a primarily working class background, a non-white working class background, as you know. I don't think Guaido was being very strategic. He probably thought that because of the fact that the U.S. were backing him, and because there's been some issues with the Venezuelan assembly over in the U.S. as well, um, he thought that because of this backing, that people would be more likely probably to cede to his ideology in that sense. And I think that, generally speaking, my take on it is, I mean, there's no shit that he would have got his shit beaten out of him because, as we've seen before, the working class don't support the coup. It's only the upper middle and higher class that do. Right. And of course, while this is all going on as well, the U.S. is still trying to attack the Venezuelan people. They just released a a comment, I believe it was earlier today, where they said that they were going to uh, target Venezuela for the crime of distributing food to their own people because of their food programs, which is awkward considering the claim is that Venezuela isn't feeding their people, and then they go and they attack the food distribution program as, ooh, socialism. Yes, and, you know, it is a sign, again, that it's because they don't really give a fuck about feeding the Venezuelan people. They only want to use the quote-unquote fact that people are starving as an excuse to back up their own imperialistic agenda. I mean, that's always been the case. I mean, as we talked about last time as well, the whole bridge ordeal was the same kind of story. By purposely sending food to a bridge that was already shut down, they used that as an excuse to perpetuate the idea that the Maduro government were purposefully starving the people of Venezuela, which, as we know, isn't inherently true. And all the while, the U.S. is kicking out the um, consulates at the embassy, at the embassy in Washington D.C., which spawned a uh, protest by Code Pink, where they occupied the embassy and were eventually forcefully removed by the police, which was an illegal attempt at assaulting the sovereignty of Venezuela. And any other country doing this, this could have been constitute. This could constitute an act of war. No, definitely, and I think that. In a matter of speaking, it's because, in general, the U.S. aren't really afraid of war with another small country. In their eyes, it is another opportunistic example of imperialism. If they can benefit off of cooing Venezuela or of provoking them into starting a war with them, then it gives them all the excuses they have to do whatever they want with them. Yeah, and now that most of their efforts, with the exception of the embassy, which uh, they were able to successfully evict the peop- the protesters out of the embassy and also the workers inside the uh, the embassy as well, 
all while that's going on because they weren't successful in their attempt to pull off a coup in Venezuela. Now, all those people that have been rooting for doing so in Venezuela or have turned their attention to Iran and are threatening to send 100,000 troops to the region. And as we've seen in the past, this isn't the first time the U.S. has obviously targeted Iran. I mean, this has happened before. I mean, it was it was actually Britain and the U.S. that fucked up Iran in the first place. In a way, it seems almost in character, if you will, for them to target Iran again. And I, I mean, it's not that a lot of people like Iran's well, government. It's... I mean, I personally don't. But yeah. I also think it makes sense for the U.S. to go find another well, target. Well, it makes because total of... sense because yeah. the same people that are orchestrating the coup in Venezuela are the same people, John Bolton, Elliot Abrams, etc., are the same people that have also been trying to go after Iran really since the 80s, but in earnest since uh, the second Bush administration. No, definitely. Um, I will say that it is certainly in character in that sense. And I do hope that a war with Iran doesn't occur in that way, because not only will it be more devastating for the country as it already is, I mean, it's been couped before, back in the 1960s, if I'm not mistaken. We all know how well that fucking went for the country. And we all know how Almost. great the Iraq war went too, where... Yeah. It lasted a decade plus, and then on top of that, we got ISIS out of it. With all that lovely military equipment they fucking left behind because they thought nobody would fucking pick it up. Well, guess what they fucking did. The last thing that this country really does need, and the last thing that the world needs right now, is yet another needless war in another Middle Eastern country that is destabilized that's just going to either create another or create a resurgence of Islamic extremism, because as we all know, like that's just going to be used by the right wing to further their goals. And also it doesn't do anything for the people living there. Like the people yeah. of Iraq were worse off for 10 plus years. And the amount of deaths and devastation that the Iraq war caused was was one tenfold. of the, yeah exactly you know, it, was, it was it was one of it was one of the the worst tragedies of our century this century the 21st century and we need not a, a repeat of the half million plus deaths and that's the bottom estimate in yet another country and let's not forget that the majority of deaths in the Iraq war were in fact civilian deaths not military related deaths Exactly. So they, these people, they weren't fighters. A large number of them were kids as well, and people forget that. And there's still going to be lasting effects in regards to the Iraq war because of things like depleted uranium, which is going to stay in that soil for thousands or maybe even millions of years because uranium has a half-life of 4 billion years. And again, that just showcases the long-term devastation of such a war with the US can have on a simple country that is just trying to get by. Given its poor economic history as it is, and with the history of the Middle East with the US, it is again in character for them, because if the US can't justify war with somebody else to have another bad guy to point at, in my eyes, it prevents reactionaries from having another finger to point at as a scapegoat instead of looking at the material conditions of their own country and saying that maybe the problem isn't other countries, but it's actually fucking here. Right. And historically, the war drums have always been to not only conquer other peoples, but to put in place the dissidents of one's own country. So many times what we see here is these wars are used by the right to crack down on dissidents within our own country, as seen during World War I, where they rounded up wobblies, they rounded up people like Quakers that opposed the war for religious reasons, etc. In these political times, we could very much see that coming back and coming to fruition with, with how aggressive the right wing is today. You mean the draft itself or – yeah, I, I actually do think that it is very possible that we might actually see a uh, re-implementation of the draft. It does seem likely given recent years for that matter. To say the least, that would be concerning, but not out of character. Um, but since you actually mentioned, um, obviously, the Nazis, not that it's like the exact same thing, but since the Republicans are already 
getting their money's worth when it comes to that kind of stuff. Steve King, the, the cunt face, cock mongrel, Steve King. And we're not talking about the writer. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, so you're thinking Stephen King and he was actually okay. Well, he was weird as fuck, but he was all right. So yeah, Stephen King, or rather Steve King, the representative from Iowa who's been on the show before, not on the show, but we've talked about him, has yet again opened his mouth and out dropped a big pile of shit, just like it always does. He he went beyond what he normally does this time, and he decided to compare himself to Jesus Christ himself. And the best part is, is when is the best time to do this? Passover, of course. So the Republicans essentially stripped him of his committee assignment. So he's off the Agricultural Committee, off the Judicial Committee, and off the Republican Steering Committee, which is great. Now, unfortunately, the Democrats did not move with the plan to censor him, unfortunately, because they thought that that would be too divisive. I think that that was a poor judgment on their part. But just to kind of give you a take of what Steve King believes, he has endorsed neo-Nazis time and time again. Uh, he endorses uh, comments such as Gert Wilders, who was once credited with saying, our civilization cannot be restored with somebody else's babies. He is a avid advocate for the Great Replacement Theory, which is, of course, a bogus neo-Nazi conspiracy theory. Which was already spreaded by Mark yeah. Collett, mind you, who he also defended. Right, which, yeah, it, he actually defended it through Mark Collett, who made posts on Twitter about the Great Replacement in which King retweeted or endorsed his comments. He's also said and saying shit like accusing Soros, George fucking Soros, our holy savior, George Soros, for <laughs> footing the bill for it. And again... I don't know what the fuck it is with the right and George Soros, but I wonder I wonder what George Soros is doing now. I wonder if he ever checks. I wonder if he ever looks online and says, maybe I'm going to type my name in and then all this conspiracy theory shit comes up just out of fucking nowhere and tries to say that he's plotting with the left to take over the fucking world and perpetuate cultural Marxism. And you're like, what the fuck are you people talking about? You know what? As somebody who does have a little bit of infamy within the uh, certain left wing circles, I, I will say that when you have rumors spread about you, you do take a certain enjoyment in looking at them and just kind of laughing. So I think he does that. <laughs> Probably. I mean, but it's concerning because of how I think, if anything, with one person like King taking these conspiracy theories and spreading them further, I think, if anything, my main concern is, especially with the Soros shit, because, I mean, as we all know, it's a bunch of nonsense, like most conspiracy theories from the right. It's another scapegoat to blame Jewish people, essentially. It's also further inspiring people to go out there and not only come up with these crazy plots, but to do something about it. And like we saw at the end of last <clears throat> month, there was a armed militia that was detaining migrants at the borders. And there was a video where they detained over 300 migrants. And the UCP. Yeah, the UCP or the United Constitutional Patriots. There is a video on Facebook showing their entire operation, which Facebook never took down, by the way. But it turns out the leader of the UCP, Larry Hopkins... <laughs> had been, oh god yeah exactly well, it turns out the he leader is this interesting guy, fellow he, he turns to out to be a least. very interesting fellow so this guy was tipped off to the fbi because there were allegations that he was trying to assassinate george soros hillary clinton and of course barack obama he made this claim himself mind you yeah and, uh, and they were also tipped on extremist activity back in 2017 i believe um, and then they thus discovered a shitload of firearms and ammo at his local place. Yeah, well, that's what happened is is they busted him back in 2017, I believe, when the FBI went into his trailer to speak with him. And calling it a bus, by the way, is, is a little bit of a exaggeration. It sounds more like it was a friendly visit because it sounds like they just knocked on his door and walked in because he let him in. 
but they noticed that there was a ton of guns in his in his um, trailer, and he was like, "Oh yeah, those guns aren't mine; they're my common <laughs> common law wife's." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's not the only wild story he has actually been a part of. I think back in two thousand and six, he was arrested in Klamath, Oregon for impersonating a police officer while, quote-unquote, showing off his firearms to teenagers at a local gas station. And when questioned at the scene, he stated that he was working directly under the orders of George W. Bush, who was obviously the president at that particular time. Which is interesting because I actually remember hearing about that story back in 2006, and it took me a while to actually, like, put it together that it was that person. But... Now that it was mentioned and, and remembering back on that time period, I actually remember reading about that. And it's it's funny that we see the same person almost 10 years later up to the same kind of no good crap that he's always been up to. It's, it's the same kind of story, really, with the organization. I mean, the organization itself, the UCP themselves, they basically, long story short, they became well known in 2018, but have been operating on social media since 2016 on Facebook. I've checked their Facebook page and it has been operational since 2016. And meanwhile, Facebook are fucking cracking down on left wing groups, left, right and center, while all these vicious racist pricks are allowed to do whatever the fuck they want, I guess. Um, but long story short, the group itself became more known back in 2018 by joining forces with two other groups that were infamous at the time, known as the Patriots of the Constitution and the Mountain Minutemen, who developed a particularly awful reputation for being scumfucks for their continuous detainment of migrants and violence against them, who they termed as invaders, quote unquote. It's always invaders. It's their favorite fucking word. Um, Hopkins himself also stated that his organization was planning, obviously, to assassinate Soros, Clinton, and Obama, as we previously stated. But the thing is, what catches me on the most about this statement is his reasoning for this was because they apparently supported Antifa, which is obviously the right wing scapegoat for everything they don't like. Which is funny because they never actually have a definition as to what Antifa is. And they make it sound like some shadowy terrorist group that has this leader that's always in the shadows kind of thing. Uh, a little bit like the, the Sith, if you will, of the left. And huh. we have no such concept on the left. It's, it's fucking laughable. It's hilarious because they must think they think we're, this, we're, this, we're some sort of centralized entity that we plan everything out viciously and that we're pulling the strings but to be honest it's a fucking shit show left right and center i mean if they actually saw the left but even if we even if they did see us for what they were they still probably wouldn't believe us they probably say that oh it's just some sort of it's some sort of psyop but getting back on to the actual groups themselves um the ucp recently broke up with the poc and mm because of the fact that there was infighting between them over the funding allocations for their funding campaign in other words, they can't fucking figure out something simple between the three of them. Yeah, um, and, so. and this isn't the first time that we've had militias on the border. This is something that has been a very long-standing, unfortunate tradition within the United States. During the 70s and 80s, Klan and mercenary groups created several Border Patrol militias for the purpose of intimidating and harassing migrants. And operations existed in tandem with militia training for the purpose of conducting race war. Border Patrol itself has its origins uh, with Klan activity in the 1910s and 20s, as well as the Texas Rangers and also other groups that came together to form the old Border Patrol Guard in 1924 when Border Patrol was created, all these groups got together and they volunteered for those positions and created the Border Patrol originally. But during the 70s and 80s as well, there were individual clan and mercenary groups patrolling the border in tandem and assisting Border Patrol operations illegally. No, and it's, it's not surprising really for the U.S.'s history, given the deep-rooted racism within your country, even after the Civil War. It's a sign, really, that all of your government institutions have this ingrained sense of racism, whether it's the police or whether it's Border Patrol, whether it's customs, or whether it's the military as well, even. You know, it's it's an indication that 
the institutionalized racism within your country is, has always been there. It's just not been noticed. And this is something that actually dates back to really before the Civil War with the Border Patrol, not because they existed then, but simply just the attitudes that were held towards Hispanic people along our frontier borders has never been charitable. It's always been a policy of expansion and of securing that the western border, which has become the southern border now. And, and this continues to this day. And even like back in the 70s and 80s, the, the scary thing about those particular mercenary groups is or those groups were terrifying because they actually would go out and literally hunt migrants coming across the border. They went into people's homes and shot them uh, if they suspected that they were living in a trailer or something like that. They put tire Even spikes. These, yeah, yeah there, was a, there, was a, there was a there was a case in the 1980s, I believe, where one of these groups put down tire spikes on the road and shredded a car's tires and then shot everybody inside of it. So these are aggressive, dangerous groups. And this is what we're seeing returning. And they're getting more and more bold as time goes on. And by their own statements, like they, they, they're telling us what they're planning on doing. And we're going to start seeing, if we're not careful, a return to this violence. Well, we, I think we already have. I don't even think we've definitely went past it. I think that it's always been here. In general, especially on your end, where, again, it's completely ingrained within your culture, in a way. It's always been part of the material reality over there, as something that has been normalized in that sense. And I believe that, in a way, it is Trump's scaremongering of migrants in return that has led to a material increase in the amount of these groups that are targeting vulnerable families, regardless of whether they're legal or not, if you want to put it like that, if we were speaking in terms of the context of law. These these very same people, I mean, they have even stated in their videos, I mean, and I've seen some of the videos, and they have explicitly stated that they don't even consider the, the the children of migrants to be fucking children. You know, it, they it absolutely is pure... don't. They they look at them literally as as some sort of insect. And it is deeply concerning in that regard. And bringing back over the conspiracy stuff I mentioned before, these very same people, the UCP in particular, mind you, they justify a lot of their violence about, about migrants and their appeasement of racial discrimination with members spouting a very common conspiracy theory in conjunction with this. This conspiracy theory relates to what is known as QAnon. Uh, this, the QAnon conspiracy theory, for those who aren't aware, it's is like literally the theory of everything, kind of, right? <laughs> Not even that. It's to do with an individual known as Q, quote unquote, working within the government to aid in countering what is known as the deep state. And obviously... The deep, the deep state conspiracy theory is also a big load of fucking nonsense. It's complete yeah. scaremongering well, about the state. The and Q it seems to think is, that... Yeah, the Q theory is just one component of like the grander like Illuminati type thinking that goes yeah. on on the right. It's like none of that stuff really surprises me. And I, I've seen the Q, like the boards on 4chan that talk about Q. And I, I've even seen like the diagram they have where... They managed to link every conspiracy ever thought of and then some on a flow chart. And like reading this thing is absolutely amazing. And we've talked about it on a show. Well, not you and I, but I believe it was with Eno and Hems. Yeah, and a while back. I think. Yeah, it was. I, I have to say it, it, it is an impressive piece of work in the fact that it is very intricate and complex. But it also kind of shows like the level of paranoid thinking that goes on on the right as well, and just how unhinged and dangerous they are. Definitely. And I also, again, feel that this puts a lot of vulnerable people in difficult positions at risk of susceptibility. Because when people are in desperate positions, a lot of them want to go and look for answers. And because conspiracy theories provide occasionally complex, but more simple answers for material problems, vulnerable people are always drawn to these groups. And I've seen this happen before. I've seen vulnerable people go from pretty neutral politically to far-right scapegoating, gun-toting 
paramilitary within the span of probably a few years at best. And, you know, it's a sign, if you will, that in a way, these conspiracy theories, like we just said, they purposely are designed that way. I do think a lot of these conspiracy theories, in a sense, are a, prop- are a very useful propaganda tool so, for oh, definitely. groups like these. So the thing that makes conspiracy theories so attractive is they take complicated issues and they break them down with simple solutions. And you get one part of the solution that's very easily digestible, mm-hmm. but it's not even – it's not necessarily true. It's just easy to, to digest and therefore easy to believe and say, oh, you know, I could see that. And so what ends up happening is you start – believing one conspiracy after another because each conspiracy itself seems very simple in and of itself within the vacuum. And then after a while, you become susceptible to this kind of thinking as a whole, the whole conspiratorial thinking. And then that's where it really becomes a problem. And that's not to say that there aren't real conspiracies out there. Uh, There are, there are, tons of real conspiracies out there it, by the definition of a conspiracy being a group of people doing something in secret for nefarious or not even necessarily nefarious means. Uh, we see this uh, recently with pharmaceutical companies. There was one in India that produces all our generics. Uh, there was a story on Democracy Now! the other day where they were talking about how this company was bribing U.S. officials to sell generic drugs that were tainted. So Mm -hmm. we have this situation now where all our generic drugs in the US or a good portion of them might not be safe because of common practices that are going on within these companies. And it's, it's really disturbing. And those are real conspiracies that we should be focused on because they materially affect people's lives. And the key word there is material. You know, they are part of our material reality they are not they're not idealistic formations of something that doesn't exist right we're that not is creating the a conspiracy to explain an ideology or to implant an ideology in somebody and that's the difference here we're looking at things that actually did happen i think that's what's important i think a lot of people on the left particularly they're very dismissive of people who spout conspiracy because they seem to feel to often realize that people who susceptibly spout conspiracy theories are people that have been manipulated by right-wing ideologues into a certain thought pattern i actually spoke about this a while back with a few people and i do think that in order to counter a lot of these conspiracy theories i think more leftists need to spread the materialist philosophy a bit more and when I say the materialist philosophy, I mean by by looking at objective matter for what it is and by explaining things based upon that objective matter instead of simply suggesting that everything is a product of one's consciousness. You know, because when somebody believes that everything's a product of their consciousness, eventually their material consciousness takes over and they become susceptible to the very things that the writer's spouting. Right. And and then, of course, while the right is spouting all of this nonsense about how Mexico or the Illuminati or whomever are sending waves of migrants into our country to destroy the country or or whatever, uh, and it's going to bring about this authoritarian regime, the the authoritarian regime is already here in the form of the Trump administration. Just recently, two students were – are are facing criminal charges for calling border agents murderers and protesting the presence of Border Patrol at a career fair at their university under the guise of free speech laws, essentially stating that they were saying that their performance... It went or, against yeah, the yeah, peaceful their, conduct, I believe, or something. Yeah, so they were saying that their protest went against the peaceful conduct and peaceful presence of Border Patrol and therefore was threatening speech when they didn't threaten them and they were well within their rights to protest Border Patrol at the career fair. No, definitely. And I think this also relates, funnily enough, to another thing that came up recently with a Boston area judge, I believe, and trial court officer 
who are now facing up to 20 years in prison after they helped a undocumented immigrant escape from members of ICE basically back in April of 2018, according to an indictment, I believe, unsealed on Thursday of last week. Yeah, you're talking about the uh, uh, the judge that just basically let the guy escape through the back door, essentially. They went off yeah. the record in the courtroom. There is an ICE agent waiting in the uh, front of the office. The, the, to... public al- of the public gallery, yeah. Yep, the judge <laughs> knew that they were there and essentially was just like, you know what, I'm going to let you out of the back door. You know, one has to ask, like, why was ICE even there if the guy was in court to begin with? Like, like what, what jurisdiction or presence did they have at that point? One of the reports stated that the migrant themselves had a, I believe it was something to do with drugs or something. I can't remember what it was in particular. But the point of the matter is here, people aren't satisfied, if you will, with ICE as a whole, with how they've actually treated migrants. Because even if the migrant has done something wrong, I think the judge themselves, who's titled as a Shelley M. Joseph and her uh, assistant, Wesley McGregor, they were aware, in a way probably, of how harsh I saw when it comes to treating any migrant. Well, I, I think a lot of our our justice system is very much aware of what does go on inside the uh, internment prisons and stuff like that. that. It's not necessarily that they have direct access to it, but... With them being a judge and with them knowing so many people and dealing with so many people every day, it probably does come within their like purview of knowledge or within their scope of knowledge, rather. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I can definitely, I can definitely see that at the very least. And you know, given how again we were talking about the fact that these kind of theories have led to these kind of actions against people who are either spreading you know, that are expressing their own free speech, rather, or members of the justice system who are going against injustice. I believe that a resultant of this has also been, of course, as you know, Trump's threats, or his additional threats, if you will, to send... Send troops to the Mexican border, yeah, that he's wanting to do that. Which, honestly, I mean, like, what's he trying to accomplish here in the long run? Because the only thing that I could really see sending troops to the Mexican border is going to do is create an international incident where somebody gets shot and either Mexico or some country in Central America is put in a a position where they have to defend their own people, which honestly, like, I'd really even like to ask, why is it Mexico cracking down on the uh, United States? Why aren't they sanctioning or punishing the United States for the treatment of their own people within the U.S. I don't know, maybe a fucking entire army of soldiers is a bit of a deterrent. Yeah, I I would guess so. Uh, But it it would seem like that they would be a little bit, I mean, if if I were in charge of Mexico, if I was a Mexican president, I'd be a little bit harsher towards the United States when it came to this kind of stuff. And you damn well guarantee you that I would be mentioning this in negotiations, and I don't think it is. And I don't really think that the Mexican government has shown a lot of care towards their own people and the safety of their own people if they're letting them die coming in, in into the United States. And the thing is, is the Mexican constitution allows their own people to enter and leave the country pretty much whenever they please, which is more than our constitution do- allows. What, because your constitution imprisons you basically by birth, or what? It doesn't allow for freedom of movement, interestingly enough. Uh, So there there are certain freedoms that you would think that we have, but we don't really have. Like, we don't really have a right to privacy, for instance. We have a right against search and seizure, and the courts determine what is in the purview of the definition search and seizure – And that changes all the time based on court rulings. We don't really have a right to travel. We have a right to travel as long as we're not suspected of anything, but we're also not allowed to just leave the country. We have to exit through ports of entry and ports of exit, for instance. I've never really understood that about the Constitution. I don't really see why people should be restricted on their ability to travel, especially in the quote-unquote land of the free where people are supposed to be able to do whatever they wish in that regard, they should be able to travel without difficulty. And I think the same thing should be extended to migrants. But again, because of the institutionalized racism and because of the 
deliberate targeting of migrant families by the state and by property, obviously they are getting the blunt end of it. And I think that's also clear in the administration's um, recent, well, according to basically a recent report last year, the administration themselves have considered detaining migrant children in Guantanamo Bay. And the excuse for this, if you will, was to aid in the over the quote unquote overloading of ICE detention centers, which migrant children, mind you, have already fucking died in. Yeah. And now they want migrants to die in Guantanamo Bay and be held right next to what are or could be dangerous terrorists. Like hard actual, dangerous, actual people, yeah, yeah, actual people that may have may have posed a threat. Like we we don't really know because they haven't been tried, but they want to put migrants next to accused terrorists. So that tells you how they view the migrants. So they they literally view them as invaders, as terrorists, and that really goes to show just how serious they are in their rhetoric that they would send children, mind you, to Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a sign that the, de the dehumanization process has gotten that far. It has went that far and it has gotten to that point. And the overloading of, quote, of these centers, mind you, how many centers are there in total? Again, like an average estimate of centers for the whole country. Well, according to the same report, um, supposedly over 46,000 people have been detained collectively in all of these centers as of. Um, yeah, because I knew the year. number. Yeah, because I knew that the <clears throat> number was about 46,000 people. I just didn't yeah. know how many centers there, there were exactly. I, I believe that regardless, the quote unquote influx in these centers is a sign again. It is clear that as a result of these statistics, and from even the opinions of certain statisticians and experts that the Trump administration has encouraged this direct and deliberate targeting of migrants, regardless, again, of their criminal records. If that wasn't enough, on top of wanting to shove all these people into camps, send them to Guantanamo, send them to you know whatever infamous freaking military prison they want to send them to, on top of all that, the government has been creating reports tracking the periods of young girls in these camps, and, and they've been this, doing and I this. I believe this was in this was in relation to. Um... So it's it's actually in reference to Scott Lloyd, who was the head of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. He's since now been fired. However, during his term, he was compiling these records together so that he could stop young girls from getting abortions. And what he would do is he would have these reports created. They would have when their period stopped, whether or not the sex that they had was consensual, all sorts of different information on there uh, regarding the circumstances of the pregnancy and how far along they were, and some other various notes uh, that were placed there by government officials to essentially assist in blocking their ability to get abortions. The entire scenario was so bad that there were girls out there that had permission from judges to go out and get abortions because they were raped. They were, there was one girl, she was 12 years old, she's a rape victim. Uh, uh -huh. She was in one of these camps and they wouldn't let her get an abortion. So she challenged it in court and she won and they still locked her in one of these compounds and would not let her get an abortion because apparently having an abortion takes more maturity than being a mother at 12 years old. Apparently. According because, to the, yeah, because the their, their entire thing was, oh, these girls are not mature enough to make this decision. And that was their whole schlick, even though the kids are apparently mature enough to die in what is essentially concentration camps. Right. They're, they're mature enough to walk through the desert and risk death to come to America to escape whatever hellish conditions they were living in, in Guatemala, Nicaragua, Mexico, just wherever they're from, and come here of, of all places to start their life over. 
and to get away from what are natural disasters, gang wars, drug wars, authoritarian governments, what have you. Only to be denied those rights further, right. whether it's the right and, to and, movement or the right to bodily and so autonomy. Many, and, and that's the thing about these militias that we were talking about earlier when they go around and they drive around the border and round up these people. These are people seeking asylum. They have a legal right to be here because they are seeking asylum. And these people are acting as dangerous vigilantes going out there threatening their lives so that they can pretend to be fucking cowboys. And and, and that's what they are. They're, they're a bunch of gun-toting idiots who think that they're doing people a favor when in reality they're not. They're not doing anybody a fucking favor. They're going around there, swinging their guns around, probably getting people hurt as they have been, as it's been recorded before. And, and the interesting thing about all of this is like Scott Lloyd's own personal history. And it all starts to make sense once you put that all together, because it's bad enough that he did this. But it turns out that Scott Lloyd's previous position was with an anti-abortion, anti-contraceptive advocacy group called the Knights of Columbus, which is a Catholic uh, so-called uh, fellowship. And I hear you groaning because it sounds like you know who this, these people are. Not even that I know who they are, but considering the fact that it is a fellowship for a centralized religious institution, I can already tell that it has some very reactionary viewpoints. Yeah, and so this spreadsheet that was compiled, this 28-page document that was leaked, was created at his behest to continue his work, essentially, with this group, I would assume. To top all of that off, if that wasn't enough... He was also working with Bathin Christian Services, which is an adoption agency that receives hundreds of thousands of dollars in funding from Betsy DeVos. And BCS is known in particular for denying LGBTQ couples from requests to adopt children. However, what makes this extremely egregious is the fact that these migrants' children are being ripped from them and then put up for adoption. Like this is literally the kind of stuff that was done in the United States to Native Americans and done in Australia to the Aboriginal population for the purpose of destroying these communities, that they would rip these children apart from their, their culture, their tradition, and raise them up in hopes of them essentially supporting the regime. I mean, this, this same happened in Africa with the British Empire, even. And as we all know, this is all of this is a form of genocide. You know, it is. There's no. Well, I mean, it's it's literally a, a form of genocide. It's it's literally a definition of genocide uh, according to the UN themselves. Like their definition includes the forced transaction of children as as genocide. And that's exactly what this is. This is ripping kids away and giving them to white people who will raise them as white people separate from their culture. Certainly not out of character for our regimes, to say the least. Yeah, and so it really just shows that all of this, the border project, etc., is just a larger component of the historical settler colonial agenda that's been in play for almost 200 years on the American frontiers. No, definitely. And again, I think it's also a sign that if people want change in your country, they need to realize the impacts, if you will, of their material culture or their material history on present families within your country. And I mean, you see this all the time, even as a, a visitor, you know, obviously I am not a local in case people aren't aware. Um, <laughs> you know, even as a visitor, you know, I've seen how poorly affected, even in very wealthy states, mind you, in the South even, these families are under. I mean, one fellow I recall, even when I was over as a tourist in particular, you know, he actually had to come over and ask me if I was able to help him buy groceries because of how broke these people are. You know, and this, this fellow has children as well and a wife and they're still fucking struggling as it is. And if it's not racial and if it's not minorities within America that are American citizens that are struggling, it is people within America who aren't even citizens that are getting 
punished for the littlest things. This is the resultant of it. This is the reality of it. And that hasn't changed in a very long time, even from an outside perspective. Right. And this isn't the only abortion news that's happened in the United States. This has been a hot topic now for uh, a couple weeks where several states in the South and Midwest, Georgia, Missouri, Ohio, Mississippi, Alabama, and I don't know if I missed one or not because there's just so many states rushing through laws right now to effectively ban abortion and ban it at periods that have never been banned before in a long time. And all of this is, is of course, challenging the Roe versus Wade ruling. And the, the entire reason that they are doing this is because of the new Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh being nominated to the court, that they believe that this is their time now to have this decision reversed. And we're going to see a lot more activity in the Supreme Court as time goes on. In the meantime, what we're seeing is we're seeing an assault on women's rights through abortion bans across multiple states right now with, of course, Alabama having the worst laws on file where their laws go way past the idea of a heartbeat bill, which is bad enough because it's an emotional bill that's not based on medical fact. Is that why it's called heartbeat? <laughs> yeah, that's why it's called heartbeat. It's not called the smooth muscle development bill <laughs> of 2019 because that just doesn't sound as exciting now, does it? Because the truth no. of the matter is, is just because the fetus has a heartbeat doesn't mean that it's conscious. It, it's not yeah. thinking. And that's a concept that these people don't get because I guess they believe that our conscious pre resides in the heart or something like this. And it's not even uh. really... A heart is so much as it is – it's the formation of the smooth the, – the involuntary muscles. Am I correct? Yeah. OK. Uh, so so I get that. <laughs> it, uh, I, 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 it's, it's hilarious because even over in Ireland, which is where I'm from in case people haven't fucking figured it out, a lot of anti-abortion people over here, they use the same story. They use – Stuff that isn't even medical fact, mind you, and use it as a way to deny people their right to bodily autonomy. The thing is, they also act like a lot of the time, I think, a lot of these people, whether it's in the States or whether it's over here or whether it's anywhere else, they have a tendency to suggest, if you will, that these people actually are excited about getting abortions, you know, that they actually think that, oh, yay, let's go get an abortion done. Let's fucking throw a party. Oh, yeah. You know? No, they, they totally do. They, they absolutely totally do. Trump's rallies, like one of the big features at a good portion of his rallies now that he's been doing is that he goes around and he's been saying stuff like doctors after they deliver a baby have a conversation with the parents in which they talk about whether or not they want to kill the baby after it's been born. Mind you, not, not we're not talking about abortion. We're talking about actual like Trump is spreading the rumor literally that doctors are promoting infanticide at this point and that parents are like, hell yeah, let's kill this baby. I mean, it's it's fucking it's, it's ridiculous and sick. This whole idea is coming out of a lie that is being spun because the truth of that is and where the kernel of truth that lies in the statement that, that Trump is lying about is that doctors have conversations with patients when their babies are born with an immediate terminal illness and the baby can't survive outside the womb or is going to die anyways. And they have the choice of letting it die over the course of a few days or terminating it then and there, and what do they want to do with it? And I dislike the fact that people are spreading the idea. Yeah, exactly. I mean, could you just – could you yeah, imagine, though, they, that like they, if you're one of these parents, though, that had one of these kids that it was like an inviolable birth? Yep. And you were having this conversation with your doctor about whether or not to terminate the baby, and you – had to choose that option because you felt that it was the most moral option at the time. Yeah. Like, could you, could you imagine just 
place yourself in the, in those shoes. And I know that's hard because obviously you're, you're not a woman, but imagine like you're the father and it's your wife or, or whatever, you know, whatever yeah. theater of the mind the listener wants to place them in. Just put yourself in that position for a second and then think about having this decision politicized on national television and to have Trump lie about this conversation that you had to have with your doctor just so that these people can try to make abortion illegal. And, you know, I think it's rich in that way that they think that people want this, as I've said before, you know, the people are eager. But the thing is, it's not an easy medical procedure to get done. Nobody goes and says that they're excited about this or that they're over the fucking moon. You know, it's not an easy thing to get done. It is, in fact, a very, it's often a very traumatic, you know, thing for people to go through, you know, especially if they've been, you know, a victim of rape or if it's been anything else very serious. The point of the matter is, though, their, their arguments for going against abortion, it's purely ideological. It's, you know, it's not based on medical fact. It's not based upon medical evidence, nor is it based on the wishes of people that are getting this done. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's not too even based maintain. off of, it's, well, it's not even based off of reality. These same people that are against abortion are also against contraception as well, which is the very thing that would prevent an abortion in the first place. And it's also not like these same people would pass bills that would help these children out that would have been aborted. That once you're you're born and stuff, you're on your own. That's They care about the baby when it's inside the woman. They don't care about the baby when it actually is a baby, when it, when it is is a child, like th- that baby. Well, if they, well, if, they, if, they if they if they if they did care about babies, then they'd give a shit about migrant families and their babies, but they don't. Yeah, you know, because it, they don't like view you them said, as they, such they anyway. don't, and and not only that, they view them as as objects to be possessed, essentially that they they take them away from their families so that they can have them and raise them as their own. And that's the nefarious thing is it, you know, this is a very it's it's pronatalism in the worst way possible. And in a way, do you think that this uh, crackdown on abortion, if you want to call it, because it's certainly it seems like a crackdown from my perspective. Do you think that this was a long time coming or do you think that maybe it's the resultant of just the Trump administration? I think it's definitely a result of the Trump administration. I I actually do not believe if we had Hillary in in power or any other Democrat that this would have happened at at least to the scale that it's happening right now. What's really going on right now isn't even necessarily Trump, but it's the fact that he has one Supreme Court justice in there that will get him what he wants. And we are one death away from him appointing another one, God forbid, should RBG pass away. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of funny that, you know, as a as a as, you know, pretty hardcore communist, you know, a Maoist, if you will, that I'm sitting here saying this, but it's it's true because if he appoints another Supreme Court justice, there's not going to be checks and balances on the court for 20, 30 years. Like Trump will leave a a legacy on the United States, and we're already seeing it in other areas. There, there's a big Supreme Court push right now to get everything through that they wanted to get through. If it's not abortion rights, it's LGBTQ rights or it's labor rights, uh, which right now we're seeing the Supreme Court go into overdrive. So there is a recent Supreme Court ruling. It was Lamps Plus Incorporated versus Varlea, and this was a labor issue involving arbitration clauses and employee contracts, and it essentially made them valid. And what this does is it essentially recognizes the fact that employers can force their employees into forced arbitration instead of bringing class action lawsuits against the company. That if you sign one of these contracts, you have to go through the company first and you can't file a class action lawsuit against the um, their um, your employer. This is a huge problem because a lot of workplace organization happens through this kind of activity actually and also a lot of sexual harassment cases get resolved 
through these kind of class action lawsuits as well, because it's yeah. one of the few ways people can come together to address sexual harassment in the workplace that doesn't feel threatening because oftentimes what companies will do in forced arbitration is force you to sit down with your accuser in front of your boss and have to explain yourself and your story to your boss with the person that sexually assaulted you in the same room to give his testimony. And we saw this recently with the Riot Games walkout, which occurred very recently and is in fact the first major walkout in video game history in that regard with over 150 employees, if I'm not mistaken, right. walking yeah. out as a result of forced arbitration it, and exactly. misconduct. Exactly. And the thing is, is that one of the uh, one of the people that participated in the walkout actually said when they went through forced arbitration, they got punished and the person that sexually harassed them or sexually assaulted them got a promotion. And that's the kind of culture that exists in a lot of these game companies, but also in a lot of our workplaces across the United States, yeah. we see this kind of corruption. And I mean, if it's not if it's not crunch right. culture in video games as well, which is also a big problem. I mean, video game employees, for example, they are often subjected to horrific periods of crunch. I think some are often working over 80 hours a week without choice because the problem is if they refuse to do that, they'll just get sacked or right. fired. And, and, to, and to kind of put this into perspective to tell you how much they work, you're talking 80 to 100 hour weeks, which yeah. is a lot. But to put this into perspective, Nintendo, a company that is pretty infamous and kind of created this whole work crunch culture because this was kind of the norm in Japan that you would – Spend Definitely. 12 yeah. hours at your job. And then on top of that, you, you would have to go hang out with your coworkers and your boss at the bar for three or four hours. So really, you were dealing with your coworkers, dealing with your boss most of your day. When you put that into perspective, those kind of hours, it was a normal occurrence for a Nintendo employee to effectively be, effectively be working almost 12, 13, 14 hours a day. That's on par with what we're seeing today. And today with American companies and AAA studios, really, it's worse. Much worse. Uh, definitely much worse. I mean, you know, yeah, some I mean, of the reports finally, you hear we... with people experiencing relationship problems as a result of work losing 10% or more of their average mass and often breaking down in the middle of fucking work. It's clear that... And the thing These is, companies, it's, it's they not don't even care about it's, the well being of well, the companies don't care who about put, them. Who put, who put effort into these creations? You know, they do because they care about them often. More often than not, they do, but the companies don't. You well, know, yeah, they they, never they, have. of course they care about them. These these games are, are their life and their legacy, and they, they want to be remembered by these games. They they do want them to be the best games that they can make them, and they're great employees for that. The, and these companies are taking advantage of this. But the other thing is that I really feel is honestly, I don't think gamers are doing game developers enough justice. Enough justice. Exactly. Because gamers are going out there on Twitter and attacking game developers online for talking about this kind of stuff and telling yeah. them and they're, they're essentially telling the, the game developers, sit down, shut up and do your work. I didn't like this game because it didn't have this or, or that feature. And, and, and honestly, like, I'm or so... That a, or because that a woman in the front cover. <laughs> exactly. It had a woman in the front cover. It, and honestly, like, I'm so fed up with the attitude that gamers have and they're... they're in, and just... They're, the, it's they are so... a, the gamer culture has developed. I think, to be quite honest, I think a lot of studios are responsible for this development in gamer culture. You know, as we all know, video games back then, at least, you know, before I, before, before, before you I were, younger. but when I was a kid, you were younger. Video right. Games so were, were, I, and I, I should probably, if I was not mistaken. yeah. And so like, I, I could actually attest to this actually, you know, I, I was a kid of the eighties. Uh, I loved me some Nintendo. Now I wasn't there for Atari cause Atari, the, the entire gaming industry crashed one year right, before yeah. I we yeah, one year before yeah. I was born in 1983 and then in 1984 Nintendo launched and they had a conundrum nobody was buying video games in 1984 <clears throat> and so 
they were spending this entire year trying to figure out how can we get people to buy video games? And their solution was, well, market it as a boy's toy. And so yeah. most of their games that came out in the United States and it was the United States that this was targeting because that's where the gaming crash mostly occurred. Most of these games targeted young boys. And then they realized a few years later that they had a problem that girls weren't asking their parents to buy them these systems. And so while they felt obviously alienated, from exactly, the marketing. They, they felt alienated due to the marketing. So there wasn't a lot of girls that got into gaming. And so they cut themselves off from about half the market and created a boys club full of essentially what would become entitled jerks just because of how gaming companies kept continually approaching men with video games. And I think, Ian, I do think that a lot of it is the product, if you will, this whole attitude towards crunch with the gaming community not really giving a shit. And that's not to say a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people do. But a very large majority don't. I mean, that's much as clear. But I think that again, yeah, and, and the other thing the that resulted, pit, the other thing that sorry. really pisses me off though about the the AAA studios and stuff like that, and gamers like, if you're really gonna criticize gaming, why don't we criticize the fact that for the last twenty years since Halo came out, that video game stu studios have gotten away with effectively publishing the same FPS game and just updating the skin on it game after game after game. Why Why yeah. are we criticizing that? That this particular model is a dominant model of video games to the point where it is so played out. I don't really see how you can get very many, many more iterations of it. And that's not to say that there are good FPS games. And honestly, they're not my thing. But if, if they are your thing, go for it. But there's so many of them and so many are so alike and even AAA games that they pour billions of dollars into are just so similar to each other now. It's like, what's the point at this point? You played one, you played them all. Let's, let's criticize that instead of... Instead of the developers themselves. Instead of the developers themselves. You why, are why trying we... their best to give them a bad and situation they... more often than not. And the thing is, is that's the thing, right? Like they're pouring their heart and souls into this. They're, they're, you could tell these games, even though even though a lot of these FPSs are, even though it's a worn genre, they put their heart and soul into this. Like, yeah, these some games, of them are mediocre, but they try to put a part look, themselves. They into, look you know, nice to play. I, I I will admit, if I didn't get sick playing a, a 3D perspective first person shooter game after about an hour or so, I'd probably be down for it, to be honest. Yeah. If I was a little bit more coordinated with the controller, but I, you know, I I kind of like drift towards RPGs, puzzle games, and platformers myself. I like the old school gaming, but I also like it when they put a new spin on it. So I like things like Super Light Drifter or Race the Sun. You know, simple games like that that are done by indie studios, but you you still look at them and they're still great creations. And those developers also put their heart and soul into it because they love their work. And these employees need to have their grievances heard, especially in the cases of things like sexism, sexual misconduct and stuff like that, because nobody, nobody deserves to be sexually harassed in the workplace. Gamer culture that has been formulated over years by mass marketing and by, you know, mass media, it is very much to blame for a lot of this. I, I think that if we want to see change in that particular sector of employment, I do think that not only does the gaming community need to step down on it more, but I also think that people within companies need to obviously do more of this. They need to strike more and they need to make their they need unions. Their employers away. Well, I also, like, union. I, th I think they, they need unions, groups. but the other thing is, is instead of having these big studios that are just going to like hire people, make them crunch and then fire them uh, later and then don't pay them their bonuses. Yep. You, you know what these developers need to do? They need to come together. They need to create co-ops, need to work on games together, get them out there, get them published. And even form indie studios and a yeah. lot of developers have been doing that. And I think that's why in a way we've been seeing a resurgence. I think if game developers came together and both unionized and also created co-ops, that we would see a huge renaissance in gaming. It would be 1985 again. It would be mm -hmm. like, like that period in the 80s where you saw a bunch of different genres and different ways of games being conceived. And 
and designed mm-hmm. that, that were never conceived before. Because before 1984, game design was really score focused. You didn't have a lot of games with stories in them. It was oftentimes shoot the thing and you get a point or do something and you get a point. It really wasn't until Nintendo came along that you got a variation on that where you actually had a goal and you could beat the game. I could really see that in a few years, if game designers had their unions where they could speak their piece and also if they had co-ops so they had their own studios that were ran by them, they could create some really cool stuff because they would be able to create all the games that they couldn't create with these big studios because they won't allow it. No, definitely. And um, speaking of obviously that sector of employment, we were also going we also mentioned i believe uber at one point oh or have yeah we uh we've not mentioned uber so you can go ahead no, and mention no. uber well basically uber as people have probably been made aware of they've had a day of strikes well they had a day of occurred. strike because uh uh they went public and they did what's called an initial public offering or an ipo where they essentially give people a uh, a discount on their stock price kind of thing and announce that they're going public and all that stuff. And so right as investors were trying to jump on board with this, Uber drivers... Because they saw, they saw dollar bills in their eyes, basically. Right, exactly. So Uber drivers went on strike that day. And I've heard a lot of horror stories from Uber in particular, not just over there, but over here in the UK as well, with people being underpaid as usual. I mean, it's not even just with Uber, but it's also with Lyft, I believe. Lyft have also had issues in the past, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if... Uber, Lyft, all all these real gig economy jobs, honestly, have all had problems. They're terrible jobs, if you could even call them that. I mean... Well, I mean, they don't even have the same rights as... Well, there's a reason it's called the gig economy. It's a gig. It's not a job. That's what people don't understand. A gig is is something that you do on the side to make money. And now people are doing this to make money because they can't find jobs or it's difficult to get jobs in some areas. So they're stuck doing this thing that was essentially initially something set up to make a little bit of money on the side. But now they need to do this all the time to top all of that off. These people are contractors. They're not employees. So. Any wear that happens to their car, any kind of incurred cost, et cetera, all of that stuff, they have to take care of themselves and document, et cetera. And then they might or might not be able to get a tax refund off of it, depending on if if they're qualified to get one. And then on top of all that, they have the stress of having to deal with their own taxes because they're 1099 employees and not 1040 employees like you and I. So. Yeah. They don't file a W-2 when they join Uber and then Uber takes it out of their paychecks every paycheck. No, they have to file an estimated payment every quarter. They have to figure out what they think they're going to make every 90 days and pay that to the government. And then at the end of the year, if they overpay, they get some of it back. And if they underpay, they have to pay in more. This structure creates a huge tax burden on the person doing it and a lot of stress yeah. because they're managing a business essentially while also having to deal with being an essentially an employee by Uber. They can be fired at any time if their score be- drops below a 4.0 because Uber doesn't like it when you give somebody a 4 on Uber. This particular gig economy, if you will, it is very much based on that kind of vicious exploitation that isn't protected, unfortunately, now by labor laws within regular workplaces, even, which is why obviously, as as was said, you know, they don't have the same kind of rights as people like ourselves who work nine to five jobs. I mean, I think I read at one point on The Guardian that uh, who were reporting on the strike at the time, one particular driver named Alex, who was demonstrating outside of the San Francisco Uber headquarters, he stated that he couldn't afford to live in a city. And as we all know, San Francisco is very expensive to live in. San Francisco is works. one of the most I mean, expensive cities in the United States to live in. Yep. And I mean, he drives in every day from Richmond, which is across the bay, um, to support his wife and six-year-old son. He reports driving up to 16 hours a day, five days a fucking week. 
And he reported that he drives in every day from Richmond across the bay, if which is across the bay, if you will, um, to support his wife and six-year-old son, driving upwards of 16 hours a day, five days a week. The old rates for Uber were 99 cents a mile, and now they've dropped from 99 cents a mile to 68 cents a mile. Uber themselves made the audacious claim that drivers make, on average, $18.65 an hour, which is bullshit, because independent studies have found recently that the hourly wages of a driver are closer to $8 at best. Which isn't even minimum wage. If you live in Oregon, California, Washington, anywhere on the West Coast, it's not minimum wage in a lot of states. The only places that it's minimum wage now at are in certain states in the Midwest and the South who, by and large, only have to abide by the federal minimum wage law, which is seven twenty five if I recall or seven fifty an hour, which is you can't live off of seven fifty an hour at all. You can barely live off of ten dollars an hour. And I mean the Uber CEO themselves, uh, a Dara, I believe, um, reportedly purchased a home in San Francisco in twenty eighteen for sixteen point five million dollars. While people who are working with Uber as drivers are struggling to even pay their rent. The fact that this kind of economy is allowed to flourish. They're, they're literally allowed to violate labor law by calling themselves something else and then getting out of it because there's no regulation around it, which shows you how weak the labor laws are if companies can just do this, if they can just call something something that it's not and then pretend like there's little to no regulation in it or call somebody a contractor when they really are an employee. And Uber's not even the, the only company or even the worst offender when it comes to labor practices within the United States. And, and that, that particular title probably would go to Amazon if we were talking about large companies Ugh. with how they, <laughs> they treat their workers because a recent report in The Verge said that they had obtained redacted documents showing over 300 workers that were fired from a single facility from August 2017 to September 2018 due to inefficiency. And the documents – that were obtained the documents were obtained by Morgan Lewis which is a law firm that represents people for the National Labor Relations Board among other things and this particular facility was a facility in Baltimore and mm -hmm. it had two and a half thousand workers so 2.5 thousand workers and it managed to shed 10% of its workforce in a year due to product productivity reasons. It's nuts. Completely nuts. Um, I believe the report also stated that... This, um, is, this is being done through automated tracking. They use something called the Rabbit, yeah, which is yeah. a device that they scan the packages with, and then they take the packages and de deliver them. And this thing effectively just has a GPS built into it and a monitor in it so that it knows when you're moving. So effectively – It's all in <laughs> This is – so effectively what this is, is essentially they, Amazon has created a device that tracks you. It, honestly, what this sounds like, this sounds like you're on parole when you're at work. They put the little ankle bracelet on you and you're in prison while you're at work. If you – Take a little time to stop and take a breather. They count it as time off task or TOT according to these reports. And if you get enough TOT, they pull you aside and say, hey, you know what? I see you're having too many ba ba bathroom breaks there. Yeah, I even see, bathroom yeah. breaks. Yeah, even bathroom breaks, which is are actually illegal because it's a it's medical actually. thing. It is. In the United States, it is illegal to punish a worker for bathroom breaks. Uh, they have to find reasonable accommodation for those kind of things. And so even regular functions are considered reasonable accommodation for even a normal healthy person, much less somebody who might be sick, in which case they have to be given a job in which they can reasonably complete. And as we see here, what we, what we find more and more is, is that due to the demands of Amazon, even healthy people can't reasonably complete these tasks. There is a guy, he was 
in the army. Uh, his name is Eric Jeffries, and he was an army combat at arms specialist. He said that his job delivering packages was nearly impossible in the nine hours allotted by Amazon and that he would have to illegally park, load up a bag full of packages and sprint to the de to whatever destination and then find somewhere else to do the same thing. And he said even doing that and trying to get as close to these places as possible, even with mm -hmm. him being physically fit and army trained, he found it more physically and emotionally challenging than the time that he spent in the army. We're talking about an organization where people regularly deal with trauma induced by combat, people getting shot, people getting their arms and legs blown off. And I mean, let's not forget that Amazon themselves are basically um, paying an effective tax of negative 1.2% to yeah, the United yeah. States government. Exactly. And, and all the while, while this is happening, while people are, are sitting here suffering, working shifts that are almost 16 hours long in some cases, because the, the typical shift, even though Amazon says it's 930, let me give you the, time, the, the breakdown. 730, arrive at work. Routes are not assigned until 8 o'clock, 8.30. Between 9 and 9.30, the drivers load up the trucks, and then at 9.30, they're off delivering those packages. By 6 o'clock, they should have the packages delivered, but sometimes it can take up until about 9 o'clock. So sometimes they're out from 7.30 in the morning till 9 o'clock in the evening, and that mm -hmm. is 7, so 12, 8, 13, as 14 hours there. And then here's the thing. You don't get to go home if you finish early. So let's say it's four o'clock and you've had a good day. There's not very many packages. You're, you're done. You actually have to go back to the station and load up your truck again with emergency packages to be delivered. These are packages where workers who were working behind schedule didn't make their packages, so they dropped them these are back. Extra jobs. Yep. And they do get paid for these extra packages, but not as much as you would think. And you're still talking 7 30 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's an 11 hour shift, not nine hours, because you got to be there two hours early so that you can get your route assigned to you and your truck loaded up. And you can be. And I'm guessing they don't give you a choice if you. And they will don't. They the don't give thing. you a choice, and if you take days off, uh, it can result in termination if you choose not to do a route because uh, it was an extra route that you were assigned. You can be terminated. They are really strict with their workers, and they push them to limits that are just. It's unacceptable, you know. It's, I mean, it's we unacceptable we about, because we talked about Amazon last time, me and you as well. Yeah, we talked about how even workers are using bottles to piss. Oh no, in. that that was actually that was, today's that the, story. That that was the, oh, really the the, the, yeah. the well, we talked about it before, but well, we did, yeah. But people that work cleaning out these trucks and repairing the trucks and whatnot between shifts. Or even people that have been called in to use somebody else's truck, for instance, often says finding old bottles of urine in the trucks because they're not able to even clear them out is very common. That there are multiple stories where people have used the bathroom on themselves. They've used the bathrooms in people's yards because they had to go and they couldn't go anywhere else. It's amazing that they're able to do this in, in this day and age. This honestly sounds like something from, you know, like one of Upton. It sounds like the it sounds like the 19th century. It sounds like oh do you remember that do you remember that book The Jungle by Upton Sinclair that you were probably taught about in high school? Well, we didn't get taught that unfortunately, but it's essentially about the food industry and mm -hmm. The working conditions inside the food industry, and it takes place in a sausage factory. In fact, I think it's the Vienna Sausage Factory, in fact. And when was this published? 19th century? And it, I think it was uh, beginning of the 20th century or end of the 19th century, and it was horrible. It resulted in regulations on food and not so much regulations on work, unfortunately. Uh, Upton Sinclair said that he aimed for America's heart, and he hit their stomach. It's, a, it's an old statement, but... 
it's it's an odd statement, but it, it goes to show just this is what they're bringing back, and and you're yeah. And what you were saying earlier about Amazon paying an effective tax of negative 1.2, the American people paid their money to Amazon, basically. That's what this yeah. means. About Amazon 11, got money 11, from 11, your pocket. 11 billion, I think. Yeah. It's yeah. 11 billion. So they got a, they got 1.2% off of $11.2 billion in profits. I mean, Ireland has a notorious history as well with giving – corporations tax cuts i mean google were a pretty infamous example for the republic but i mean the fact that amazon are allowed to get away with this in such a large and probably one of the wealthiest countries in the world mind you is just and, and you know what the worst part about all of this is what? the the worst part about all of this is the sheer fact that amazon and other corporations sat there and lobbied the republican party who then passed a bill to lower the tax rate from 36% on these corporations down to 21%, which was their effective tax after they did all of their little loopholes and stuff like that, which some some companies, even like Amazon last year, still got money back from the government. But they went ahead and they lowered it to 21%. They're still getting money from the government. They're not paying it in like they were. So not only did we lower the revenue that is coming in from these companies, the government is paying them. And on top of this, running up the deficit with your money by giving it to these corporations. And I think it's interesting that that is the biggest takeaway from this. It is Amazon essentially being business as usual. Yeah, but and, are making more and more money out of this business as usual attitude, right? And also the public indifference towards and Amazon this will gladly use treatment. our citizens, our publicly educated citizens who went to school with schools funded by tax dollars. That they will use the roads funded by tax dollars to deliver their packages. That they will use our infrastructure, which helped pay to create the internet and create the lines on which the internet, all of that stuff was yeah. possible in part through our tax dollars, maybe not in whole, but in part through our tax dollars. And Amazon is the one getting the subsidy on this, not the American people who, by the way, on average actually had to pay in this year to the, uh, to the IRS because Trump, to make it look like he lowered our taxes, <laughs> lowered the withholdings on the W-2 forms so that if you didn't fill out another W-2 to correct it, you paid less in payroll taxes, so you got a bigger check. But then what he, they didn't do is they didn't change the actual taxation. So you got the bigger check, but if you didn't adjust your W-2 to adjust it back, you ended up paying Uncle Sam at the end of the year, and you got a surprise bill. And... I'm not going to reveal which one of our co-hosts, but he got a surprise bill and he was not happy about it. And mm -hmm. you can guess how many other people, if it can happen to, to me or, or, or him or, what, you know, just a regular wagey as you like, as, as some people like to call it. Just I mean, I imagine, hate... imagine how bad it, it must be for like a family man that has like, like two or three kids. You got the feed. I mean, I know people who... I mean, are already living in the polling conditions as it is and have been telling me about how broken this surprise tax system is essentially thanks to the Trump administration's incompetence. It is. And imagine it. imagine doing your taxes, expecting I'm going to get a $400 refund once this is all over and then finding out you have to pay $1,200 or whatever. Yeah. That's a tragedy for a lot of people. Like a lot of people can't afford a thousand, two thousand dollar emergency, and that's just what the government has done to the American people by doing this. They've given them a financial emergency in which they have to pay this, and that's what's so wrong about it. On top of all that, on on top of like running up the deficit, on on top of all of that, this this is the the increase in deficit. So the actual like uh what it's so like the actual like increase in deficit was the largest increase since the great recession in 2008 Ugh. so like there's not like 
despite what you hear about the economy and stuff like that, there's a lot of numbers here showing that things are going to get really bad. Yeah. That the the national debt right now is higher per GDP right now than it has been since the Great Recession as well. We're starting to see cracks in the fiscal system as Trump wants to continue quantitative easing because the economy can't sustain itself unless it continually prints money, which is not a sustainable option and will eventually lead to inflation, which means the money that you get from your employer will no longer be enough to buy goods anymore. I find that interesting that you mention that because um, interestingly enough, I'm just going to shove this in here because I obviously have to talk about um, recent developments in the UK political situation. But long story short, the Prime Minister in the UK, Theresa May, has recently decided to resign and will be leaving her position as Prime Minister on the 7th of June of this year. And um, a lot of people have said that under her administration, under the Conservative Party's administration, mind you, that the British people's deficit, if you will, as, as you've been talking about within your own within your own right, um, that the British people's deficit has actually went down because of their administration. But studies have actually indicated that this isn't even the case. And in fact, under her administration, austerity measures have risen, people on benefits have gotten them cut and have, and have as a result, been put into shitty, miserable situations because of this. You know, it has been a disaster. Reflecting on like the, the admittatories 10-year administration of this country, we can see that the economy is even worse than what it was and the welfare of citizens in this country, whether they're going to the NHS to get health checkups, whether it's doctors in the NHS or nurses, or whether it's people on benefits. People over here are suffering because of this. And I mean, I remember one time back in, um, what year was it? 2018, yes, February of 2018, Theresa May handed out one billion pounds in her cash for votes deal which was a deal if you will for between her and the democratic unionist party basically she handed them if you will long story short she handed them one billion pounds which is which the dup for those who don't know are the unionist party in northern ireland who want to stay with the uk if you will and they are the reason that she was still in power after the 2017 elections and then one minute she's handing out a billion pounds to the DUP, but the next minute she turns around and says to the opposition that, that there's no magic money tree for the NHS. Um, yes, there fucking is love, but I wonder where all the fucking money went. It went into the hands of your, you know, into the hands of your political opportunists. And the point of the matter is, um, they always say that. They always say that they're going to improve the economy, that they're going to reduce the deficit, they're going to improve the lives for everybody, not the few. But as we've seen, what they really do is they rob the pu public coffers, steal from the people and then say that there's no money to go around because they've took it all because they've yeah. given it all away to their friends. They've done the same thing with uh, I don't want to go too off topic, but they've done the same thing with Thatcher over here a long time ago. Back when Thatcher wasn't prime minister anymore, they, they tried to whitewash her image to say that she improved Britain's political landscape. But as we saw after Thatcher. And the, the legacy Thatcherism left behind in the UK, we can see that things are worse off because of that, whether it's to do with labour laws, whether it's to do with the economic environment, or whether it's to do with the welfare of citizens. It's been a disaster. It's been but, a but fucking hey, you disaster. Know, you, you know, at the, at the end of the day, though, like, we, could, we can all just go home. F we can all just go home from work and just relax because we're all going to have good housing, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> Oh no, they want to put us all in pods, right? That's that's Oh, pods. Yeah, did, you, about did that. you hear about this? This is Yeah, long story short, um I was actually going to bring that up funnily enough when you were talking about the fact that Amazon made 11.2 billion dollars. 11.2 billion dollars and, you know, and young people are now deciding to basically long story short rent co-working spaces and take ride shares. Yeah, yeah, it's we have this whole like like so-called sharing economy that's like sprung up and kind of conceptually the same as the gig economy really. 
And I really hate this term too, um, sharing economy. I hate it because it's not actually sharing. It's more economy than it is sharing. Yeah. And the fact that sharing is what happens when I see somebody on the street and I say, you know, I see you don't have a shirt and it's cold outside. Here, take my shirt. That's sharing. That's it's giving something away. Mm -hmm. Or like, let's say, for instance, like, I want something to drink. Like uh, I was really thirsty the other day and I wanted juice and my roommate has juice in the refrigerator. Hey, you know what? If, if I drink a glass of juice, will I, I, I will pay you back for that juice. Uh, I'll mm -hmm. buy you. I will buy another can of juice. And sure thing. It's great. Like that's that's how we operate in my house that you can take something as long as it's not the last thing. Just replace yeah. it. Be, be nice. That's that's sharing. You're not. That's actual sharing. You're not. Right. And so what this is, this is not a sharing economy. This is renting just shittier. So yeah. these uh, pods, basically these pods are from a service, if you will, known as pod share. And I find that hilarious because we talked about in the last episode I was on about a service called WeWork, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And WeWork was like the work they rent you a desk. They rent you a desk, right? So they rent you a desk and, and workplace stuff so that you can get your work done. This is the living aspect of this, which is interesting because WeWork also wanted to create a partner company called We Live to do this as well. But there's already a company doing something like this in Los Angeles. We Live or? So We Live is PodShare's competition. Oh, God. Yeah. So so not only that, they have competition. and. Uh... The living conditions in these could be described as gentrified bunk beds where everything's kind of communal and you have no privacy because it's actually against the rules to even put up a blanket or a towel to kind of shield yourself off. So yep. you can't be by yourself. You're in bunk beds that are stacked up against each other, against the wall. They're all kind of in a circle, so they're facing each other. And I mean, the environment, I mean, I've seen images of the places that people have been forced, unfortunately, to rent out because the, the reasoning for pricing this is it's pricing. It's it's half of the cost of price. what you would get a studio apartment for in or Los Angeles. Yeah. 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 And the thing is, I mean, you don't even I mean, you don't even get your private bathrooms. You know, you have to share kitchen and bathroom facilities in these places as well with God knows how many people. And, well, they're saying you know, that these units have anywhere from 12 to 24 beds. So you're talking 12 to 24 people. And supposedly everybody is all vetted and stuff like that. But really, you put 12 to 24 people in an area and you can't tell me you're not going to have a conflict. You know, like you have conflicts with two and three people in a roommate situation. Sometimes. I mean, <laughs> I've had conflicts with with my roommates you know, once or twice before. It doesn't happen that often, but it happens because you're human beings in a confined space. You're going to have an argument sometime. You're, it's just how humans work. And so you're in an area, you don't have any privacy. Stuff can go missing because if it's not in your locker, it's communal, it's communally shared. So you don't have any personal property, which, yeah, even as a, as a communist, I, I do believe that people should have access to personal property. It's it's not conductive to just have all communal property because nobody wants to share your toothbrush. You know, nobody <laughs> wants to nobody wants to share your your bar of soap or whatever. I don't care if soap is self cleaning. I don't care. It's gross. It's been on your nutsack. I don't want it. Yeah, and uh, but the thing is, you know, the point the point of the matter is, I don't like how. I, from what I've seen from this, and I, and I mean, it is ridiculous enough as it is, but because it is, it, it it's it literally the only reason this exists. Well, one of the main reasons is the rent. But what annoys me is it's the fact that the media are spinning this in a way that is beneficial. Right. You know, they're they're saying, say, oh, this oh, is great. This. this is an improvement. You know, like otherwise you wouldn't be able to have a house and you should be thankful for this. Meanwhile, yeah. our parents... A lot of our parents and grandparents were able to buy a house in their early 20s and secure a life for themselves very early on. And our generation, like the oldest millennials are almost 40 now. They're, the oldest millennials are 37, 38 years old. Many of these people, they don't have they, – they don't own a home 
they they still rent. Some of these people still live with their parents, live with family. They couch surf. This, you know, some of the like record numbers of them are are, are homeless. Like it's, the problem's getting worse and worse, like on a monthly basis now. Same thing for us, you know, in Gen Z, it's the same thing. You know, we're going to be dealing with that as well. I mean, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know anybody in my generation that still is able to afford a fucking house unless they come from a privileged family. Yeah, and and you're in Northern Ireland in a different country, different culture, that different everything. But yeah, there's lower you... living costs, mind you, than the rest of the UK and obviously the United States. Exactly. You, here's... you have lower living costs than uh, a lot of the, the first world, and yet you can't afford these basic things. No. And unless you have extremely low living costs and therefore you're probably going to live in a very, very shitty trailer or a camper or whatever, you're not going to have a house if you're 20 unless you're rich. Yep. And the thing is, it's like you, you can't even work enough to get – to afford college to even get a job that pays well enough to get one of these homes anymore. This is becoming ever more off limits to large sections of our society. And this is a huge issue. And people mm -hmm. deserve better than to be cramped and pay $40, $50, $60 a night to live in some freaking communal dorm. Yeah, exactly. They, they, this is literally just treating people like cattle. This is effectively like like what exactly what you talked about, like uh, with the the we live thing, where we were kind of uh, you know joshing around and comparing it to um, sorry to bother you, where we everybody we were, sorry yeah we where did, we were exactly, and it's so much of this like shadows that that it's it's fucking dystopian and disturbing. And how the media treats this, you're right. It's absolutely disgusting. It's demeaning. And people it is demeaning. Should, and it's, people and it's should, not that people, not that people, people should, should feel personally insulted when they see these kind of articles on the news. They, 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 they are insulting your intelligence. And it doesn't matter if, it, if it's coming from futurism, which I believe is um, – that's The Verge, right? I, I mean, I'm not sure. Somebody's going to probably correct me. But this was coming out of NPR – there yeah, is, was, yeah, this was, yeah. There is a, a, I believe it was a California's public radio also did a story on it on their website, 89.9 KCRW. Uh, the Daily Dot did a, a, a report on it. Business Insider did a report on it. I mean, I think that they all honestly probably did the best report on it because at least they weren't glowing about it. And fucking Vice did a report on it. And to be fair, at least theirs wasn't glowing either, but... They still kind of spun it as, as like some positive. But I'm sorry, this isn't an upgrade. This isn't there, – there's nothing positive about shoving people into into bunk beds and charging them money. Yep. No, definitely. I think people should definitely be more up in arms about this because I haven't really seen it, seen it uh, talked about anywhere else. Like even though this was a thing that started probably last year, if not the year even before You know that. what's interesting? This has been going on with this company for six years. And really, okay. we, we haven't seen a lot of press on this. Like it, it hits the press, but nobody really talks about it. Like it's an article and it disappears. And again, it's not that people should feel invalidated for wanting to live over people. It's that they don't have a fucking choice. Exactly. You don't have a choice in it. It's just like you don't have a choice if you live in a camper or live in some tent. Like these these are situations. The is, they're that, not even they're not even good material environments. Right. They're not even good for communal living. You know, they're not. Like from what I've seen, they look fucking awful. They do. They they look awful. They they look like Shitty gentrification, not even good gentrification. Like it looks yeah. like what you like when you say the word gentrified, what you imagine. But this is like a facsimile of it. Like it's not even like the real thing. Like it's a cheap knockoff. And so you have this aesthetic that it's trying to be. So it, it's an insult to your senses as you're as you're going in simply because, you know, they think you're stupid. They may as well. And I, I'm just, I don't know what else to say other than I'm just shocked that it has not been talked about more, you know. But yeah, but I think another thing that annoys me as well is when it comes to a lack of coverage with certain issues, whether it's to do with housing and whether it's to do with a lack of affordable homes for people being forced into desperate situations, it's the lack of, the, it's the lack of discussion, if you will, 
on recent LGBTQIA rights violations by, of course, our favorite administration, the Trump administration. Trump administration and the the recent Supreme Court rulings that uh, – and this is – like we we all saw this coming that the Supreme Court would eventually get a case that will decide whether or not it's uh, illegal to fire someone for being uh, LGBTQ. Uh, however, it's coming very soon. That so yeah, there there's a few different cases here: Altitude Express versus Zarda and Bostock versus Clayton County uh, will be challenging the federal prohibitions on employment discrimination. On the basis of sexual orientation and RG and GR Harris funeral homes versus the EEOC will be asking the same question about anti trans discrimination. And so, I I mean, when are these happening? They actually were going to be hearing those towards the beginning of May, which has already happened. I believe that they're still in deliberation on that because these cases take time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we definitely will be watching and reporting on these when we get more information on these because it is something that they are going full haul for. There's a reason why these cases are being pushed at this time. And it is strategic and it has to do with Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. And God forbid Uh, if we get another – well, if we get – if we if we get – have another Trump appointment, it's it's over for the next 20 or 30 years. You will see this shit ram through at light speed. I mean this came about after Kennedy, I believe, announced he would be leaving the Supreme Court last June. The right (laughs) has been trying to ramp up their attacks against LGBTQ rights against abortion, against all their other pet issues, including labor, all of it. They have been preparing for this for a long time, and they knew when Kavanaugh got into office that that would be when they could make their run for it. And now that we have questions about RGB's health, there might be a second appointment. This this is not good. No, definitely. And I mean, we all know Kavanaugh's reputation as a social conservative. We all know this, and then we also know— He's a scumfuck. We long also, story short. <laughs> exactly. And then we also know that on top of all of this, this is going to embolden extremists because if they reverse these decisions, people will use this to attack LGBTQ people. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it because that's the whole point of it. They want mm-hmm. to go after these people. And whether it's you know a workplace violation, whether it's sexual harassment, whether it's it's rape assault, whatever, their goal is to strip rights from LGBTQ people from that community. And yep. a lot of um, gay conservatives, particularly, they have a tendency to defend a lot of the decisions that they have been making. Like they, they're trying to say that they're not they do. going even, against all right. Even not. more yeah. liberal ones are, are falling even, yeah. for yeah. for this kind of stuff. There was a, a a so-called lesbian radical feminist that chosen by basically the Republic. A turf. Yeah, basically, yeah, a turf. Uh, she was a turf. We will say the word here. So yeah, yeah. this, this turf was selected by a Republican caucus to represent as a witness in a congressional testimony where. She gave testimony about how she felt that trans women were taking away from women's rights and pretending to be women and such and such and endangering in bathrooms. And she gave every same turfy bullshit. Every we've all heard before everything that you've heard before, and she's giving it in front of Congress. Meanwhile, there's actual expert witnesses with data and not pulling shit out of their ass testifying in Congress that have much better testimony. And this is who they choose. They choose somebody that doesn't have evidence, doesn't care, and will sit there and, and push and tow whatever line, whatever thing they want her to say. Yeah. Just so they could do – it's not even like they care about her because the GOP, they're not radical feminists and they don't like lesbians. They chose her – as a propaganda tool. It's, it's another tool. And Terps have always been a good tool for the right. You know, they've always tried to say that, you know, even though far right idiots are often very anti-feminist. But these particular feminists, TERFs that is, right. they 
are tools for the right because they enhance the anti-trans agenda. You know, they they do. And I mean, studies, as you've said, have indicated that more than, you know, more than half of transgender people in the US have reported experiencing some form of violence, intimate violence, that is, from their partner or, you know, acts of Their partner, of their, their family, people, you just people on the street that they don't know. It's I mean, even 47% have experienced fucking sexual assault. Violence against trans people is an epidemic. It's it's a disease. It's a disease. And it's terrible. And then if you want to throw in the racial element, trans people of color are twice as likely to be killed than than white trans people. Like, it's absolutely insane, some of these numbers. And just... What they have to put up with day to day is just absolutely ridiculous. You could go on any major – and when I say major, I, I don't mean like like that popular. But just a lot of the people that I know on Twitter that are trans have mm-hmm. to have to deal with the just the kind of shit that just blows your fucking mind that they have to deal with every yeah. day from people just showing up in their mention, mentions and – Telling them how they're not valid and how they're crazy and that, yeah, it's desperate. It's, I mean, people desperate. people always make the, a lot of again a lot of conservatives, even especially LGBT conservatives, they go around and say that or make the excuse often that it's just the internet. But the problem is just saying it's just the internet in these kind of cases ignores the societal factors that are encouraging and, and it ignores the fact that so of much of the, of the hate that we've seen on the internet often comes to into it our comes own, to light in real it life comes, it, comes, you know, it does it comes to light it materializes that whole thing with the new zealand shooter where the guy shot up 50 people in two mosques yeah that began as internet stuff and ended yep. in in the real world uh, mm-hmm. we we've had numerous mosque shootings now we've had church shootings these are common well, things this, that happen hey I mean, the same was happening over here. There's been over a hundred or more mosques attacked yeah. for different, and that's ridiculous. But it's a similar story, if you will, for anybody, whether you're neurodiverse or whether you're trans or whether you're part of the LGBT community, you are targeted, if you will, on purpose. And then by um, these imagine, animals. imagine being assaulted, being beaten. By one of these brown shirts and a red hat, yeah, and then and then the ambulance show up and they refuse to treat you because the paramedic doesn't believe that they should have to touch a gay person. God forbid, because it's against their religion. Because that's exactly what the Trump administration wants to do. They have a bill. It's a re, it's a so-called religious freedom bill that they're they're wanting to get passed that will essentially allow. Healthcare providers to choose who they serve on the basis of their religion, which I'm sorry, you took a fucking oath. You took an oath. I mean, what ha- what you, happened to the fucking you, yeah, When you, when you, you, know, when you took to that it? job, you took an oath to help people. Do and no the, harm. It, exactly. Do no harm. I, I've actually heard arguments saying that the the for profit system in America itself is actually a violation of the Hippocratic Oath. And well, it is like it certainly is. I think any form yeah, of exactly. And and, and I and I would I would definitely agree with that particular assessment because refusing care, regardless of reasons why, is doing harm to somebody. Yeah. By not acting, you are still allowing that to happen. So therefore, you are in part responsible. It's like if you see someone choking and you refuse to call an ambulance. Or like actually you, intervene. Yeah, you are, you are not even even if you like. There's a difference if you're aware or if you're not aware. But if you are aware and if you're fully witnessing that, you are allowing that to happen. You know that is in a way it is still doing harm when you are complicit with harmful ideas. Right, or with and then the, and then to top it off, situations. what they're doing is they're allowing yeah. the person to gen- then give the excuse. Oh well, I I just don't believe in that. It's my religion, and we've seen just, this, uh, and and we've seen this used before in the United States to deny health coverage to to people in the LGBT community. Yeah, I, I mean, mean there the were there were crisis was a 
basically a big anti-gay fucking thing. And then there was obviously the Lavender Scare, which a yeah. lot of people probably don't remember. Well, obviously I wasn't around for it. Well, yeah. And then there was like the whole like AIDS thing where, yeah. and most of it was bullshit. And people <laughs> died because of these myths that got spread. And then there are people out there that are just cold hearted. There was a case, I believe it was back in the 90s. I, and I understand that's a long time ago, but keep in mind, this is what they want to bring back where a black trans woman was denied medical care when the paramedics arrived. They just let her die. And in a way, not a lot has changed since those decades. You know, in a way, it hasn't. You know, that rhetoric has always been there. And it's only started to come to light thanks to the activism of trans people because they've decided to not take any more shit from these people. And obviously they're pushing back as much as they can, as we've, as we've seen, and they're trying to progress even further. But, you know, and, obviously and I, we have I think that that was, that. that was the right attitude to have. That these people yeah. are very courageous people. And, you know, like there, there's the, the meme that, you know, we're braver than U.S. soldiers. But if you really think about it, I mean, the, the rate of death among trans people versus the rate of death among U.S. soldiers – Trans people Big actually – there's there's a difference there. And actually, if you really think about rates and numbers and, and stuff like that, you are more likely to die because you are a trans person. Mm -hmm. that, that That is going to be a factor in your death more than likely than joining the military is a factor in your death. So, and I don't, I, don't, I don't see the justice there. <laughs> exactly. This is – being trans is – more dangerous to somebody than some of the most dangerous jobs in the United States. And people need to let that sink in. That's where we're at in this country. And it's getting worse because the brown shirts and the red hats, they are getting emboldened. And God forbid, I, I just I fear what they what they are going to do next in this country because, mm -hmm. you know, something big is about to happen in this country that mark my words before the election, it's it's going to get bad in this country. They're they're going to go for for broken here, and I think after the elections, it's going to get weird and weird like you've never seen it in this country before. That it's I I really do think Trump might not step down, or he might try to appoint somebody or something like that. It's wild. I would not be surprised if something goes down during the transition period after the election and of course right before the election i think we're going to see a lot of ramp up in white supremacist terrorist activity yeah. and you can mark my I mean, words as, on as that. if it hasn't been bad enough already right on a global it, it, scale not just in the u.s but obviously in europe i mean Poland, even in the as we've seen, even in the u.s like we have desperate. we have somebody inspired by trump doing an attack every other week now like a and major, they call us violent a major attack every other week now in the United States, we have something where multiple people die. And the thing is, it's funny because they call us violent for basically opposing their right to, well, not even, it's not even a right, their will, if you will, to spread bollocks on institutions so they can recruit more. And meanwhile, we get called terrorists for throwing milkshakes at fascists. I actually forgot to mention this earlier, funnily enough. Yeah, yeah. Over, I over, mean, exactly. Over like... in the UK, over in the UK, <laughs> for people who aren't aware, the recent trend among anti-fascists, if you want to put it like that, has been going into McDonald's or Burger King, buying milkshakes and throwing them at fascist politicians or conservative politicians, for that matter. Nigel Farage recently got his taste of. I believe it was vanilla. Yeah, it was a vanilla. It was a vanilla so milkshake. I, I do. I do have a question. Do you think he yeah. enjoyed Five Guys on top of him? I don't think it was Five Guys, or was it? Uh, I think it was. Actually. I don't know if it was or not. <laughs> I just wanted to make the pun. I'm sorry. I had it in my notes somewhere, so I had to. I had to use the joke. It was like the one joke that I, I had that I absolutely had prepared. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You guys had to hear that. Oh God. I don't know if it was that particularly, but long story short, during a Brexit party rally, we recently had the European elections over here, and obviously the Brexit party being so pro-Europe and everything, I say sarcastically, um, we're campaigning in Newcastle, I believe, which is over in England, the north of England particularly. And people are obviously very fed up with Brexit over here. 
And Farage thought it was a good idea to go down a, down a town centre and campaign with his, I'm trying to think of a polite word to call them cunts, but I don't think there is one. And uh, long story short. Yeah, long story you might short, wanna not want to use that word uh, simply because our audience is American. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but the C word makes Americans really uncomfortable. Like oh. it's it's we it's we, like, we drop it like it's out of style. Yeah, over yeah. Here, so. so like it's like the second or third most offensive word in the American English. I mean, it's offensive over here, but yeah. we say it all the time. Oh no, we no, just... I t- I totally understand you. Like I, I get that. It's it's like part of the culture. You don't think of it as being like it's it's not as severe, but like not severe. Here, no, like 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 our listeners are gonna hear this and they're gonna be like. Whoa! They're I mean, gonna be like, he must be I'll from Australia that. or something. <laughs> <laughs> Some people actually say that, but anyway, or was like, fruits fuck today. But basically, Farage and his group of gentlemen, if you want to call them that, you mean uh, Sargon of Akkad, aka Carl of Swindon, and Tommy <laughs> Robinson, and some old dude. I'm gonna that, get to them. Yeah, get <laughs> okay. to them. I'll get to them. Farage thought it was a good idea to go down a town centre in Newcastle with his Brexit party bus and campaign. Well, obviously, the people of Newcastle were having none of that and decided to milkshake the fucker like there was no tomorrow. So obviously his expensive suit got fucked. He called everybody violent. they They like to call us uncivil, but hey, I mean, at least we didn't beat the fuck out of him like they did Guido. And kick his ass out the neighborhood. I mean, I mean that's true. I think, I think honestly, if it comes down to it, we're capable of much worse. But the point of the matter is, after Farage got milkshaked, he went on his Brexit party bus, and he never got off. He stayed on it for the entire ordeal because he said, as he said, quote, um, in a publication by the Independent, I think he said that quote, if he steps off that bus for thirty seconds, he's going to be mobbed, and he was right. He was going to get mobbed. There was people standing outside the bus with fucking milkshakes. I read that report and it didn't sound like the pe- the milkshakes were visible. They just s- it said that there were people in hoodies that could have had milkshakes. <laughs> that, was great. that seemed like that seemed like the, the report that I read had worded it like that. And I was like, that's a really interesting way of wording it. So are they saying that they did or did not have milkshakes? I would really like clarification <clears throat> on that. I don't think I don't think there was much clarification. Oh, I do okay. think maybe it could that be it likely was, that it, it, they I've may have had they may have been armed with milkshakes. So yep. I, I have a request for our audience here because I know a lot of our listeners is furry. If you would like to portray one of these little babies, Farage, Tommy Robinson, Carl of Swindon, whoever, <laughs> your your favorite one as a duck covered in the milkshake. And it's obvious it's a milkshake. I don't care how you portray it. I will post it on Twitter if you draw this. I will retweet you. I will whatever. Uh, if, if you make this, because in my mind, it is really funny and I want to see it materialize. And I'd... Uh... I, I'm definitely behind that. You will you will get a shout out on our show and you will get retweeted by the Spartacast League if you uh, are able to create this thing. You, you get to be cool like us. Yeah, yeah, you get, you, yeah, you get a you be cool. <laughs> you you get a you get to uh, you, be mm-hmm. retweeted by a uh, a podcast with an audience of about 120. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing is you mentioned uh, before that Carl Benjamin, who was the UKIP candidate, who said that he wouldn't, that he was, who basically made rape threats towards a Labour politician during yeah, he the did. local it, I mean, like here. a rape threat versus getting a little bit of milkshake poured on you. I mean, th- this seems like civil stuff. Like, come on, these, he, these he, are got, not, he got milkshaked. These are it not wasn't the mobs. First time. These these are not he mobs. Got. This is this is direct action, but it's pretty simple direct action. But the thing I like about this is, this was very effective. Oh, it was. It deterred them and it humiliated them. It did. It, it was humiliated. the same with Tommy they were, Robinson. They were Tommy Robinson went about and campaigned. And I mean, him and his folks tried to beat up the people who'd done it. But in the end, it just made them look even worse. Yeah, they and, got... and keep in mind, Tommy Robinson is a violent sex pest. Oh, he is. He's a disgusting human being. Disgusting. So so for so for any of the, any people like sitting there trying to defend these people, keep in mind who these people are and what they've done, what they've said. 
versus a little bit of milkshake. Because yeah. honestly, they could have had a lot worse done to them. And a lot worse. I mean, honestly, and, and we, some, we if some people had their say, it would have been a lot worse. Let yeah. me tell you. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, is, it's not like it's not like they were assaulted. It's not like like somebody you know, went on a happy slap and they said it was political violence a lot. I mean, even Farage said this. He said that there was political violence against him. But the point right. of the matter is, on a technicality, hey, it well, wasn't. You know, on a legal, on a legal technicality. <clears throat> sometimes not. you're you're bigoted and intolerant, and then other times you're just lactose intolerant. So. Yeah. And as they say, lactose the intolerant, and I think lactosing the intolerant is the most gentle thing they could have picked. The, the sign that's effective is because nothing annoys these chuds, whether they're on the internet, whether they're in real life spreading their bollocks, nothing annoys them more than being humiliated. They hate being humiliated above all else. You know, they don't like being viewed and laughed at for what they are because their ideas are that they are laughable and they should be laughed at they're dangerous in the hands of a few wrong people oh yeah yeah they're, they're 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 dangerous in the hands of a few people but at the end of the day they are you know they are laughable in that sense and they hate it they hate being humiliated in that sense <laughs> that's why it's been so effective and they call us violent and I'm 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 just gonna say really quickly or mention this. I mean, I'm, they called us violent, but we're not compared to what they've been. Right, doing and to if us. you I look mean, at I, all I, the I remember... crimes classified as hate crimes or terrorist attacks within the last yep. ten years, only two percent of them were committed by people, according to the ADL and the SL, um, the Southern Law. Uh, Southern Poverty, Southern Poverty Law Center. So, yeah, so yeah, thank you. So according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, only 2% of those crimes were committed by people that were considered leftists according to these research groups. This has been backed up by the FBI and their numbers as well, and they get these numbers from law enforcement. So it's not like they're cooking the books or anything like that. They're using the raw numbers available given to them by sources that sometimes would be biased to twist the material around. And yet yeah, what we see they is – Exactly. They can't. they can't even twist the narrative themselves when it comes to the raw numbers <clears throat> because the raw numbers is, is that – a good majority of attacks come from right-wing extremists, even if you negate like extreme Muslim attacks, because those actually don't make up a large majority. They make up about a third, and the rest of it, the rest of the two-thirds, is almost all hardcore right-wing neo-Nazi kind of attacks. And I will mention as well that you know, it's a bit of it's well. It is on topic when it comes to right wing violence. I mean, recently there's been a there's been a fund actually going on um, for a, an anti fascist who has been brutally stabbed in Denver back on April the twenty fifth right. while he removing removing and covering up. Uh, Patri it was Patriot Front stickers. Yes, yeah. outside of a goodwill, and the person who was in that goodwill came outside and basically. He basically, I think he said something along the lines of some people deserve to be in concentration camps and stabbed this person five times and cut it through their abdomen, their heart, and puncturing a lung. This person lost six pints of blood. And, they've and been the person that committed this heinous act has not been charged with these crimes. That's The person, that's... In, question is the person in question obviously is a registered Republican. And you can find actually more on the story on uh, It's Going Down's website. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, that I just broke like yesterday like, or something like that. And uh, exactly. so we didn't have time to really put it in there. But yeah, you're right. It, it was a horrible story. It's one of the most gruesome attacks in a long while yeah. that, that I could I could remember. Because stabbings are different than shootings because stabbings are a very personal kind of thing. You oh, don't are. get you don't get a lot of stabbings that are strangers, especially in the United States where we have guns. Usually, stabbings are reserved for very personal crimes yep. because of what you have to do, and so you don't see as many of those as you do random shootings. And that's what really makes this heinous is is the fact that it was so violent that it it was in front of people and nobody did anything to stop this person 
I mean, I doubt that they, they could, but like everybody just kind of sat there while this guy just ran in and stabbed this guy for taking down uh, for a few fucking yeah. stickers. Yeah, for like taking down a few stickers. Yeah, a few stickers. And this person's now in hospital. And I'm glad that the anti fascist community have been, and not just the anti fascist community, but people in general have been, you know, they've been going on the fund, they've been giving money towards the healthcare expenses. And I think that. You know, people are in support of this right. person. For and, doing and the other thing good. is, is like, we need to realize, like, if you're out there doing this kind of work in public and are visible, you need to be watching your back. You need to be careful. I would recommend that if you're going to do this kind of stuff, protection. bring okay. somebody with you. That there is there's safety in numbers, there's strength in numbers. If you're by yourself, you, you are putting yourself in danger. You you need to have a friend uh, out there when you're doing this kind of thing because these people are violent. If, if one of these people catches you and decides to do something like this, you could be very lucky to survive. This guy was very lucky to survive in this kind of – No, he was and I hope that – I do hope that – he gets better, like, it, but it was. Yeah, and I, and I hope he does like, too. Even reading it, even reading it, it's, it's it, it take was. a lot to shock like, me. Like, it, take, it takes a lot. Sorry, well, it takes a lot to shock me. Like, but even that was. A it, it it does. I mean, like, like, I saw the pictures, and I I I had to step away for a minute. Like, it was it was oh, definitely it was it was brutal. It was one of the most brutal things I've seen in a long time, and. Mm -hmm. But thank goodness they're alive. Yeah, and well. thank thank goodness for the community and for coming together to help support this person when yeah. they're in need. It's making light of a bad situation. Yeah, and thank you for thank you to them for you know doing what they were doing because they didn't know that they were going to go out there and almost lose their life, taking down right wing propaganda off of you know telephone poles or whatever. Mm -hmm. Nobody expects to go out like that. No. Definitely not. And so I'm I'm grateful that the community has come together to do this and, and I hope that we come together anytime we're we're needed to come together to assist each other and make sure that we are taken care of. Uh and also so that we can practice and better take care of, you know, the rest of the uh, the you know, the rest of the world. You know, and our vulnerable communities as well. And I think yeah, um, like the like the speaking of vulnerable communities, you know, we had a big story today actually on uh, Native rights, which I think you'd like to. Oh yes. Get into so particular. as you guys all know, uh, listening that the Midwest has had massive, massive flooding the last month or two. That we've had a lot of rain. We've we've even had a lot of rain up in Oregon this time of year. We don't particularly get a lot of rain in May in Aprilish. That usually that's when the rain starts calming down. We get it during the winter time. We got so much rain that the there's a canal that runs through downtown where I live and there's a, a little bridge and that goes over this canal and there's about 15 feet between the bottom of this where there's a bike path and a and it's going under along the canal you couldn't see the bike path cuz it was 10 feet underwater and had that thing had raised another 5 feet it would have probably took out that bridge and that was just here now in South Dakota, however, they've had massive flooding. And we're talking catastrophic flooding. So we're talking entire floodplains of rivers just flooded out. And the Ogala Sioux, who live in North Dakota, estimates that 1,500 people have been displaced from the flooding. Another 500 are left without potable water because sewage and pollution have have contaminated all their supplies because of the rivers. And the Trump administration has essentially refused to declare a national emergency while this is all going on. But what they did manage to do during this time is issue an executive order to expedite the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline during the disaster. All this, all this time, Governor... Christy Noam signed two bills into law, one to help pay for the cost of policing the pipeline in the construction zones, and the other was to create civil penalties for so-called riot boosting, which would not only apply to the rioters themselves, but anyone, including the press, 
who directs, advises, encourages, or solicits other persons participating in the riot to acts of force or violence. So in theory, this could even include reporting on protests against the pipeline itself, as well as protests involving native rights within the area of this pipeline. And I think this the story is interesting because to me it relates heavily to our previous discussion on again immigration and on you know the treatment of migrants in your country. I mean again as we right. said, I mean this is this is all the same view because same Native kind of Americans view. aren't viewed necessarily by the establishment as having the same rights as even you or I. They're not. Yeah. A lot of people don't really view them as American Americans, even though even though it is their land. To even begin though, with. yeah, it's it's their land. Like all of this is technically their land. We stole it from them, and by we, I I do include me because well, I'm part Irish and part Slavic. So like that's that is that is unfortunately part of the many sins that my forefathers came. And committed when they came to this land. And that's something that a lot of people need to kind of come to terms with so that we can deal with this, so that we can resolve this eventually. Going out and exploiting and, pro and promoting the exploitation of native lands isn't how we get this resolved. No, definitely. Um, I, I think that, again, it's, it's, it's like if it's not in Canada, as well, they I mean Canada has a reputation. Right, yeah, as well the for... the Wet'suwet'en people yes, were, yeah, were uh, was... protesting a pipeline. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, if it's not in Canada, it's down there, and it's always been the case for natives. I mean, I mean, the same happened in Ireland even long ago, and it's still yeah, kind of with, is. With in the Ireland. I mean, Ulster plantations, against, right? Yeah, I mean, racism against the Irish, even though we're not being starved to death anymore, particularly because it's just not going to be possible now. Racism against the Irish is still very prevalent, you know, much like ourselves. I mean, I talk to a lot of English people because I work in a call center. Sometimes you do get some people, you know, you do get racist remarks from people when they recognize your accent. And that's the thing, you know, a lot of minority groups, whether it's in Europe or elsewhere, they're still dehumanized even to this day through different means. Right. I'm like, by no means. Like only, somebody might not be able to I, look at you, yeah. like like look at you and say, oh, you're not one of us because obviously vis visibly you're, you're white passing. But then you speak and suddenly yeah. you have an accent that marks you. Yeah. And a and lot although of I, although like me, you are not treated as badly as the natives because the natives have been, so they've been suffering for centuries. Yes. Uh, you know, this is unacceptable. Um, but the, the vibes that are there are still persistent. Yeah. And, 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 and the anything, thing that, this is just another example in many of your government yeah, and property it, it, suppressing the rights of indigenous people. Exactly. And the interesting thing about all of this is, is the one bill used uh, to create funding for policing, which is actually called the Peace Fund and will be mostly funded in part by the government and TransCanada. That money is going to go towards law enforcement agencies and mercenary groups. So we're like talking the Pinkertons, the Pinkertons and oh, Academy. Go, yeah. And yeah, and it's interesting that like I mentioned the Pinkertons because they still exist, by the way. They they, they are not dead. I, I thought so. I actually thought they were dead. And then like a month ago and then a month ago, I'm reading the New York Times and there's a fucking fluff piece about how great global warming is going to be for the fucking Pinkertons because they're like, yeah, people are going to need to defend their property and we're going to be here for it. So these guys, they're getting they're getting ready to fucking shoot you. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that was talked about recently as well. Yeah. Um, the, these, these people, they're, they're getting ready to <clears throat> shoot you. They're getting ready to shoot Native Americans. And the thing about this peace fund is, is that this money's going to supposed law enforcement, but you know where this money's not being forced or where this money's not being not going to? It's not going to investigate crimes that occur in Native American communities when these companies come in, pull in with their workers from out of town, and suddenly a native woman gets raped or goes missing because one of these workers decides to have their way with that person. 
none of that money goes to solve those crimes. And there's been a huge spike in these crimes all over North and South Dakota as these these companies pull up, come in into these areas and and do this. It's, I think it's rich coming from the Pinkertons, the same group who made the claim that they are they were poorly represented in Red Dead Redemption 2. That they were considered villains, even though they are now being eager about the fact that oh, they, they were villains. They they they, they were absolute you know, fucking they were... villains. They they shot at workers. Like they these people, they they fucking shot at my ancestors. My ancestors yeah. lived in West Virginia. I still have family in West Virginia. A good portion of my family still lives there, and I love them. I can't stand their politics because they all turned into fucking reactionaries somehow, but. Their grandfathers and great grandfathers fucking fault the government and fault the Pinkertons so that their grandchildren, who quite frankly act like they don't <clears throat> really deserve it, so that they could have good lives, so that they could bring them up with a decent standard of living, so that they weren't working 16 hours in the fucking mine and getting paid funny money that they could only use in the fucking company store. And yep. all of that is going out the freaking window because of companies like we talked about, like with Uber, like with like with the gaming company, like with the freaking pod, like the pod share, like all of this stuff, it's connected. It is. It is. It way, is. It, it's, way, it's all connected because it it's, it's all the same system that we talk about. It's all. It's all capitalism, and it all needs to be overthrown. And I think. Um, I think when you talked about as well the um, the fact that the Pinkertons and other private security firms are eager to exploit the climate situation, I think. I think it's important actually to bring up climate again, as much as it's been talked about to death. We have to talk about it because the earth is on fucking fire. Right, it is. Of, like we got, in, in we the got words twelve. Of, in the words of Bill Nye. Um, yeah, we got twelve like, years, and then everything starts going to hell, and we don't know how fast it's going to happen after those twelve years. We don't know if we have twenty-five years after that, or if we have a hundred. And we I mean, don't, we've had we, we've had we, coral reefs flickering out beneath the oceans. And we've literally, had, like the Great Barrier like, Reef was declared dead. Like. Yeah, the ninety nine percent of the Great Barrier Reef is dead. There's, it's it is, all it's bleached. A tra- this is, it's a tragedy, and honestly, it is a complete. And they they've done other studies the now where they've mm-hmm. di- where they've looked at like how fast the oceans are going to rise, and they figured in two meters, which doesn't sound like a lot, but let's do this in imperial units for you Americans out there. That's seven feet of water. Now, seven feet of water may not sound like much, but you extend the sea level seven feet. And by the way, it is uneven because of how geography works. You're talking about having to move 200 million people. Yeah. So these companies like the Pinkertons, like Academy, which is formerly Blackwater, uh, like Titan Security, GCS, all these security companies, they're going to be the ones hurting you into, into exclusion zones where you will be worked to death in labor camps and you will die yep. because that's what they got planned for you. You are going to die. That's what, you know, that's the, that's the entire message. And I think that's why a lot of people feel hopeless when it comes to talking about the climate because of how it is. dire it's it is. Dire. It's depressing. There are people right now that have killed themselves over the reports that have come in over the last year. The most recent one of these reports in question, which is why this is coming to light again, is the UN's Global Assessment Report, which is, in essence, it's a comprehensive study of life on Earth. It's one of the most, I think, actually, it 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 it's basically a health check. It is. We're we're looking at fifty percent of mammalian species dying out, thirty percent of amphibians. Uh, I believe it was 10% of insects, and th- they said that they don't know how bad that 10% is going to affect the rest of the food chain because it's a bottom effect. So mm-hmm. literally what they're saying is is we know it's bad, and these are the numbers we think, but these are minimum numbers. And unless they're, we they're – not even, They're not even the biggest extent. They're, 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 not, they're not the biggest extent. These, these are what happens if the good thing happens and we stop it. 
it, that's what people need to be afraid of because what's about to happen in this century is going to be the biggest challenge that, is, that mankind has ever faced in its entire history. And it is it is up to my generation and yours because you are you, – I believe you're Gen Z. What? You're 21, 20? I'm 20. 20? So. Okay. So this is the biggest challenge your generation has to face. And this is something that my generation and your generation – I'll know it, it's unfair to be put on us, but we have we no, have we, we, didn't we have don't, choice. yeah, we don't have a choice. They, but the thing is, choice is when that shot out into a world of inequality yeah. into, you know, an existence like this. Yeah. We, we don't have a choice, but the thing is, is that we need to realize that we have to do something because otherwise it's, it's the end of the line for humanity. And this isn't how humanity should go out. Well, I agree. You know, I definitely think we deserve better than this. I think it's important to note as well, because the reason that this also comes up is because of the recent developments, if you will, with Extinction Rebellion. Now, Extinction Rebellion, for those who don't know... A thousand people it, it got is... arrested in London uh, because of well, yeah. Extinction Rebellion. A, a lot of young people understand how dire the situation is and want I mean, something to be done people, people i mean people at preschool age even have been yeah. at these things there there are people in in yeah you're right preschool uh, that that understand it but also just the fact that some of the biggest voices out there on climate change right now the most inspiring people are 15 16 17 year old people giving speeches about essentially how they're gonna fucking die because because of the decisions that society has, I wouldn't say decided to make, that the bourgeoisie has decided for everybody else what is all going to happen. Because they, want, because, because they want to serve a system that demands and Because work. they want to make sure that their power is secured, that they will continue to be able to operate and extract profit from us. And I mean, 1.4 million people some campaigners have said have taken part in these protests throughout many countries in Europe. I mean, London was a big example because of how bad the arrests were. And a lot of criticisms have been leveraged at a Distinction Rebellion. But I think one good thing has came out of it. And I think the main good thing that people have overlooked, both a lot of leftists have, I think, as well, is that you know, the UK is the first com has been the first country in Europe because of them to declare a climate emergency. This is also thanks to many Labour politicians as well. Not the Conservatives, they didn't give a shit, but Labour ones. Right. Did. And that's that's a step in the big in a it's a very big step in the right direction. And it's something that all countries need to do. Like this is if, if we're if we're going to it, fight a war, it doesn't need to be with Iran, it doesn't need to be with Russia, it doesn't need to be with China. It needs to be a war to save the human race from extinction because that's where we're at with this. This is – at this point, this is a war for our survival against the bourgeoisie but also against essentially what is – Against an antisocial system. Yeah, it's an antisocial, anti-humanity anti -humanity system, if you will. Yeah, like this system itself is is anti-human and will result in the deaths of everyone, including the bourgeoisie, because they will not survive. They can hold themselves up, they can put themselves in bunkers, but they will not survive it. No, and in a way, they probably and they that. and they won't even be the last people, because they will be dragged out of their bunkers and they will be shot. They will be executed. And I know that sounds harsh, but it is what will happen. They will not survive it because the people will not allow it. They can try all they want. But as someone way more famous than I once said, the Hamptons is not a defensible position. Definitely. And, you know, on that note, I've uh, noticed that we've actually linked a piece, if you will, not a not a it's not a book or anything, but like a short piece in the anarchist library titled. Yeah, I did. Die. Yeah, I did, and that's that's what this is about yeah. now. And the, and the thing is, is like this letter. I mean, yeah, it does sound dire, and the message that we're all going to die sounds really dire. But it doesn't have to be that way. There can be a new world that emerges from this. It's not going to be easy for any of us. 
not at all. And I mean, I think it, it, it talks a lot about nonviolence, particularly. I suggest people honestly read through it. It, it is. It, it does. Uh, it, um, talks it talks about, about the... nonviolence and how there are difficulties with nonviolence. Right. And the, the fact that we are being exposed to violence through climate change, that yep. this is an act of violence against us, and we are warranted to use violence back to defend ourselves, not because violence is some virtue, but because it is the only thing that we might have to save us, that we have to defend ourselves. And that's yeah, why climate. when these people go into their bunkers, they will be shot because it will be us defending ourselves from them because the next thing they're going to do is they're going to start exterminating us once they get in their fucking bunkers. That's essentially what they got for us. And I, I mean, know, this, the sounds pace, like, I know this sounds like some yeah. some right-wing conspiracy theory that would have been talked about 10 years ago on the Alex Jones show where he's like, oh, they're killing us. They're going to round us up, you know. But, you know, the thing is, is that with 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 the climate change issue this this is exactly what we're seeing we're seeing these companies getting ready to essentially democide and genocide's not even the right word at this point it's democide it's the literal killing of entire not just nations just that's the, the thing that's so difficult to grasp but the great thing about this letter this open letter from the anarchist library is that one thing that they mention, and this is something that gets brought up a lot, both left and right, is that it only takes a small contingent of people to start a movement. It only takes three, four, five percent of people getting up and doing something before there's a tipping point. And it is possible. But we also have to realize that climate insurrection shouldn't be frowned upon. It is, in essence, self-defense. I mean, to quote Malcolm X, which is also quoted in the the letter itself, concerning nonviolence, it is criminal to teach a man not to defend himself when he is the constant. It is, and that's exactly what we've attacks. been taught our entire lives. Like the American school system literally teaches you not to defend yourself against a bully. Yeah. You if you go to school and you're bullied and even if they fight you, you get in trouble for being assaulted. It's the same over here. Yeah. So that is how upside down defense is looked at, active defense is looked at in this country. That we've gotten to a point where bullies are rewarded for their behavior. And if we do not stand up to these bullies, they will continue to reward themselves. And that is why unionization, why creating things like co-ops so that there are alternatives, like in the case we were talking about game developers, uh, why banding together with community organization plans and stuff like that and mutual aid is so important. No, definitely. And I think that's some, I think, you know, I don't, I don't want people to take away from this that it should be a message of hopelessness. It's it shouldn't. Not, it shouldn't because you know. honestly, we kind of are on the precipice of something better happening. That, that we, we are. are. We're we're getting to that three, four, or five percent, and eventually, it's it's going to be ten and fifteen percent, and eventually, something's going to happen. Something's going to give, and as things get worse, climate wise, as things get worse politically. People are going to wake up. A lot of people have woken up since since Trump, yeah, since, 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 since Trump took office. The amount of participation within organizations like the IWW and the DSA have doubled and quadrupled. People are wanting to do something and they don't know what and we need to be there for them. To give that answer. Yes. And to demonstrate how things are to be done, how how we are to go about essentially fomenting the revolution, if you will. And during this time period, we also need to make sure that we are out there showing people what the left provides, what, what it does for us. Because one of the biggest problems that we had before Trump was what did the left ever do for you? And this is the time that we need to be giving answers. We need to be operating community kitchens. We need to be helping our neighbors fix their cars, et cetera. You know, whatever service you could think of, be it big or small, go out there, find people that have common interests that would like to do this and do it. 
And I know I've said do this in like uniforms or, or whatever, like, you know, make up like a uniform or something or, or, or whatever. Like, I don't even care about that. But like if you can make it visible, hey, more power to you because that's, that's just helping us. Because the more visible we are about helping our neighbors, the less effective the right's propaganda is against us because it is falsified and it is visibly falsified. So the last story on the books today here is uh, social media, and there's a lot going on there. Uh, the big thing I did want to talk about, though, uh, was why doesn't Jack ban the Nazis? Because it turns <laughs> out a motherboard owned by Vice actually uh, answered this question for us. It turns out that the same methods and algorithms used to ban Russian bots and ISIS were test ran against accounts on Twitter. And what they found was the algorithm doesn't know the difference between a white supremacist and your average GOP politician, that your average Republican conservative <laughs> uh -huh. supporter and a white supremacist, according to the algorithm, is the exact same thing and will both get banned. I can't for the life of me think of like why that would be. It's kind of... <laughs> it's I I know, right? I think we just went on. No, wait, let's not go on Twitter on the show. <laughs> so here, here we have, have the situation, though, where Twitter algorithm and even their moderators can't tell the difference if they don't have the context there of who said it. And so yeah. they're afraid that they would have to ban all of these politicians. So that, that makes you wonder, why are these fucking people representing us if they're fucking neo-Nazis and white supremacists? Because the algorithm said so, and the <laughs> algorithm can't tell the difference. And honestly, if you remove the names, we can't tell the difference either. Because the human moderators couldn't. I don't think anybody fucking could, to be honest. Yeah, if you, like, hard enough. exactly. So... When you analyze this and you analyze the behavior, the wordings, etc., it's all the same. It's and a different code of shit. Exactly. So, hey, I, I just just saying, you know, if you if you ever thought that they sounded similar, no, you, you're not pretending. It it is absolutely, it's the same move. And we've been saying this for years. I've been saying it for years. I've been saying, look at the Republican Party; they are extremists. They, oh, no, they, they're just moderates. Yeah, they're, they're, they are in no ways moderate. Heck, I don't even think parts of the Democratic Party are, are moderates, to be honest. To say the least. You know, a lot of them just pal around with Republicans anyway. So, And then if that weren't enough, uh, Facebook turns out their ad algorithm, according to The Intercept, <laughs> happens to be a stereotyping machine. Who would have guessed? Korea. Yeah. As if it wasn't shit already. Yep. And then on top of all of that... Common Dreams reported that, and actually it wasn't Common Dreams, that's just where I got the story from, but I did check it out. And it turns out Facebook is hiring the co-author of the fucking Patriot Act. You know, the company that cares a lot about your privacy has hired the co-author to the uh, Patriot Act, Jennifer Newstead. And so if you ever thought that these companies had one shred of care for your privacy or for your dignity or whatever, what have you. Now, all they care about is, the scoop people is the scooping up your information while you use it. And, you know, like I always say, I always like to point out to people, be careful about what services you use on the Internet. Be careful what software you choose. This is why I advocate for free software, both on the show and in real life. I use Linux on my computer because it doesn't have that built-in spyware crap in it. Uh, I've been de-googling my phone. I try to use Macedon and, and other privacy-friendly services online when I can, even though that's a little bit harder than just using free software on your own computer because, you know, you don't necessarily get the choice to use what platforms you use because other people are on there. But I definitely do recommend you check those kind of services out. And we're on those services, by the way. Um, I'm on Mastodon. I'm a, I'm at Kitsune Flame, which, by the way, I've, I've changed my name on there to Jazzy Vidalia. And you guys can make that what you want it to be and interpret it. Uh, I might have some big reveals in the future. And Moonpaul, uh, you have an account there, right? 
Yes, I'm I'm a Moonpaw. Well, not Moonpaw, Dark Dewoski, I believe. At, at, uh, Snouts Online. Yeah, so we're both on Snouts Online, by the way. That's our Mastodon home. We love it. And if you're a furry, you come join us there. It's great. If you're not a furry, uh, you're still welcome to join, welcome. I guess. But there is mastodon.social for you if you just want to dip your toes in, see what it's like. But there's also interest communities as well. So just check it out. And also, if you do like our show, give us a like, comment, subscribe, just whatever. Show us some love. Spread us around. Tell us, tell a friend about us. We love attention. Yeah, we, we do. <laughs> and with that, uh, I think it's uh, time to sign off. It is getting pretty late here. It's 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 actually a lot earlier than uh, what we thought it would be here. It's only 9.30-ish. So we're <laughs> it's actually- 30 minutes past five over here. 30 minutes past five where you're at. Yeah, so it's, it's 9.30-ish on the Pacific coast here. So we are kind of ending a little bit early, but I got to get to editing this episode either today or tomorrow. So I will see you guys out in solidarity. Solidarity.